All statements and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are not representative of the Ortho Chat, its host, or its producers, and should not be associated with the podcast unless explicitly stated by the host. You are listening to the Ortho Chat by Yanni Katsadas. <laughs> Greetings in Christ, brothers and sisters. Welcome to episode 11 of the Ortho Chat, and we are here with Father David Hovick. Father, how are you? I'm doing really well, thank God. Glory be to God. Uh, you want to kick us off with a prayer? Yeah, sure. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King, O Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fill us to all things, treasure of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Lord, open my heart, open our hearts to what you have for us today, for thou art holy, both now and ever to ages of ages. Amen. Amen. So before we get started with the with the time before time, what's new? What's new with you? What's uh? What's the word? Well, let's see. What is the word? The word is we just are finishing up our remodel in our church. We did a rather extensive remodel, and we've just about doubled our uh, standing capacity in our nave and in our fellowship hall. So that's been a real, real plus, really a positive for us. That sounds fun. Do you guys do any like uh, any like material remodeling, like new tile colors and stuff like that? Or yeah, well, one of the big things we did was we had carpet in there, and we tore out all the carpet in the nave, and we put in hardwood floors. So that has completely changed not only the aesthetic dynamic but the sound dynamic as well. Yeah, yeah. it's really helped us a lot. Acoustics are important, and carpet is such a nightmare to dealing with. It, especially well, I, as I've gotten older, my voice has gotten softer, so mm -hmm. it's it's been a positive. Yep. Yeah, I uh, I I'm gonna start a petition when I'm older for all churches to have uh, hardwood floors because God forbid a mistake happens when you're uh, celebrating the Eucharist and yeah. like you know you got to cut out a piece of carpet. I've seen that happen before, and it's like, oh. yeah, exactly. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. So you know. Starting all the way from the beginning, um, tell us a little bit about your childhood and what about it drew you towards a life serving Christ. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm probably be quite different than a lot of the people you interview. Uh, I don't come from an Orthodox background at all. Uh, I grew up in a uh, sort of a typical 1950s uh, home, early 60s. My dad was a fireman. My mother. Uh, was the second in command for a federal housing authority out in the city of Everett, where I grew up. So I grew up in a really a great family. Uh, my parents were very moral. Um, you know, they had high expectations. But as far as being a, in a Christian family, that would not have been the case. So for us, when I was probably about five years old, <clears throat> my mother decided that she would take us to Sunday school at a local Method United Methodist Church. So when people talk about being a C and E Christian, Christmas and Easter, truly that's how I grew up. So my we went to Sunday school on Sunday morning. We never stayed for church ever, but we would go on Christmas and Easter. So you know I grew up I guess with sort of a vague. Uh, belief in Jesus, a, a, a vague belief in God, uh, nothing very sophisticated. But by the time I was, I think, sixth grade, roughly, my dad never went to church, and he always stayed home and watched football. And I said to my mom, I'm done. I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to watch football with my dad. And so that was that was basically the end of, of 
any kind of formal church experience at all. So, and, and that story obviously flipped as time went on. Look where we're at now. So, oh, it, it's shocking. You know, we'll get into my high school years, but I think if you would have said, <clears throat> who is the least likely person in my high school graduating class to ever become a priest, it would have been Dave Holvick. That's for sure. So, uh, you know, I had some buddies and neighbors that would take me to maybe the equivalent of kind of a, a boy, Christian Boy Scout kind of thing. And I'd go that during the week. And, you know, I enjoyed it. And they talked about Jesus, but it, it never really clicked for me. Um, I would date some girls and, and one of them went to a Baptist church and I was, I think, a freshman. I enjoyed it. I liked the pastor. He was a very nice guy. I can tie a knot for a tie because this Baptist pastor taught me when I was 14 years old how to tie a tie, and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> but but as far as God being real, like really intimate, it just didn't exist. So in high school, I was quite athletic, and my world was basically sports and just hanging out with my buddies. What'd you play? Uh, football and wrestling. Nice. My dad was a wrestler, and, you know, I, uh, I'm i lazy with my jiu-jitsu, but I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well. So, you know, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm probably not where you were, but, you know, as time goes on, hopefully I'll get slightly more athletic. But anyway. I'll tell you what's funny. We've got a lot of wrestlers in our church. My grandson uh, just had his wrestling banquet last night and, and he lettered. But um, jujitsu, it's very interesting. Uh, wrestling is so much more sophisticated than when I wrestled. But yeah, uh, jujitsu is a great sport for wrestlers because mm -hmm. you can use somebody's weight and their balance against them. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's where my story takes a turn. So um, my junior year, I'm wrestling. I have a, I, I had a major knee injury in football, but I was able to rehab and come back and wrestle again. But my junior year, I re-injured the same knee very seriously. Oh, and, I'm kidding. Uh, my physician said, you can't play sports ever again. You're done. And that just rocked my world because my world was not about academics. My world was about sports and hanging out with my buddies and dating and that sort of thing. So um, what do you do with this? So we're talking about 1971. Uh, okay. Spring of 1971. That's when the world just first started to get fun too. That's when all the craziness started happening yeah. everywhere. So yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I don't want to scandalize anybody on this interview, but uh, you know, that's when I began to smoke pot yeah. and, uh, and I smoked a lot of pot. So by the time I was a senior, um, you know, I smoked before school, at lunch, after school. So that was just my reality. And <clears throat> looking back on it, I think maybe it was just the pain of not being able to compete in sports. I don't really know what the answer was. But I'm sure it has something to do with it, the fact that you were outside of athletics that kind of pushed that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, okay. no, I, I think that's exactly right. I just, I didn't know what to do with my time. So um, now we're going to fast forward to uh, my graduation. So I graduated from high school in uh, 1972. Uh, I was 17 at that point. And I began to work on what's called the Grand Coulee Dam. It's a big dam in the state of Washington. Um, I was just a, a laborer, a grunt, just to make money for college. And so this was in the eastern part of the state. And my cousin and another guy, were, we were roommates in a single wide trailer in this tiny little town called Grand Coulee. So we didn't want to drive all the way back, which would have been like four hours to get home every weekend. And my cousin's dad lived in this little town called Wenatchee, which is in the middle of Washington state. And so um, his future fiance, the, his dad's future fiance, worked for this crop dusting service. And she said to this girl that was working there, she said, would you ever want to go on a on a blind date with a, you know, and you and your sister with a couple of guys? And she goes, well, I, I don't know. I mean, who is it? And she says, well, his name's Dave Hovick and his cousin is Steve. And what she had gone to the same high school I went to, but she was a year ahead of me. And she moved her senior year. So we never knew each other. We had a lot of mutual friends. So she said, okay, yeah, I'll, fine. I'll go out on a blind date with this guy. So here we are, early June, 1972. And this is when that Jesus people movement 
was sweeping the United States. The charismatic but, movement. No, not the charismatic movement. Well, oh. I mean, in a way it was like that, but you know that new movie that just got released about, oh, I can't think of the name of it. Um, it was about in California. It was uh, Chuck Smith and, and all that. Anyway, it's- Oh, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. So that was exactly my experience. So, so here's what happened. My wife had gone to hear a person called Mario Murillo. <clears throat> Mario Murillo was a guy that converted in the streets of New York City with this Dave Wilkerson ministry. Okay. So my wife had just had this sort of dramatic evangelical Protestant come forward, accept Jesus as your savior moment. Okay. So we go, we're on this date and I went to her house to pick her up and she was cute. And I thought, wow, she's really a cutie. And so we're, we're, we're out that night and she immediately starts talking to me about Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh. What have I gotten myself into? Well, this is the weirdest date I've ever been on in my life. So I immediately, I just cut the date short. Like I just couldn't, I had no frame of reference for it. I just couldn't stand it. So I, I took her home. Well, anyway, the next night, she told me later, the next night, she kind of knew where I was going to be. And we ran into each other. And I thought, well, you know what? She's cute. And what else am I going to do on the weekend? So we started dating. And she kept talking to me about Jesus. And it wasn't that I was hostile to Jesus. It was just that it just didn't mean anything to me. It just was nothing. Um, and But she started talking to me. And then I met her mom. I met her family. And her mom, you know, gives me Billy Graham answers, your 400 questions, and all these things to read. So now something really bizarre is starting to happen with me. So I'm smoking pot before I go to work. I'm smoking at lunch. I'm smoking it when I get home. But now I'm starting to think about Jesus, just thinking a little bit about Jesus, thinking like, could this be true? Could this be more than just a story? Like, could Jesus really be real? Like, like I always say, is this true? Like, did he really die for my sins? I, I, I never, those thoughts never crossed my mind. Now, all of a sudden, they're crossing my mind a lot, and I find myself in this weird space where I'm not as comfortable getting high as, as I was. Mm. So this goes on for the course of the whole summer. Now we're at the end uh, of August 1972, and I'm going to head back, and I'm going to go to college. My wife's going to go off to college, and one night, uh, both my roommates were gone. We're in this little single wide trailer. We had a little crummy little green couch in this thing. And uh, I thought, how do you pray? I thought, I need to pray. I just, I, I don't know how to do this. But I thought, I think you kneel when you pray. And I, you know, I think you fold your hands when you pray. So I knelt down by the, on the arm of this couch. And probably the first real prayer I ever had offered up in my entire life. And I said, God, I don't know if you're real, but I think you're real. And if you are real, just take, because at this point, and, and, you know, I had plenty of friends. Like, it wasn't like my life was <clears throat> um, not good in some respects, but inside of me, there was really an emptiness. And, and I, I just didn't know how to fill that. So kind of this classic story. But anyway, I, I prayed this prayer with all of my heart. Well, I didn't hear any voices and I didn't, you know, see any lights, but I mean, it was instantaneous. When I stood up, I just was swept over with this feeling of, of faith, like this belief in God. So, you know, from an Orthodox perspective, um, what is that? I don't know. You know, I've tried, I've analyzed that every which way. But I really do believe, because I was sincere in that, that God just met me. I mean, that's where I was. And all of a sudden, I I I believe. Okay. Yeah. And, so now, you know, I feel like, you know, I like I've heard from a couple priests that they always said there's never a prayer that goes to waste, per se. Now, something I wanted to ask before we keep going is, is that this is this is hard for me to conceptualize because I I was born Greek with Greeks around Greeks. Yeah. And, mm. you know, I've never had, I guess I've had moments, you know, in my uh, in my rebellious adolescence where I was like, okay, well, how real is this? Or like, what does it mean? But there's never been, um, I guess, a point in my life where I looked and I said, 
oh well you know this doesn't really say anything to me like what what is it i guess for people that don't understand that experience what does it sound yeah. like for somebody that's not connected to christ and and has like no conceptualization about him what does it sound like hearing about jesus christ to people that don't have him around i guess in in a um i guess in like a verb or like a cultural sense or whatever the case may be yeah yeah <clears throat> i mean like i was saying before you know for me jesus was conceptual at best right that that's i just i had a little concept but only from sunday school i just so so you know it like when i was in high school um there was a few christian kids in our school but i never hung around with those people because i just i don't know I, I don't know what i thought i i mean i I just thought I can't relate to these people at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it was very challenging for me when I had this experience, right? And first of all, I don't know anybody that's a Christian, right? So just imagine that in your life. I don't, I don't have one friend in the world that I know that is a Christian. So I come back and I'm going to go to the community college in Everett and I'm hanging out with my buddies and I'm afraid to tell these guys that I've had this experience because I don't know how to frame it. I don't know how they're going to respond to it. I don't know where to go to church. I just, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I'm going to go back to this Methodist church that I went to, went to Sunday school to, because at least I was, it was familiar to me. So I went to that church and the pastor there was really a nice guy. <laughs> I noticed there was hardly anybody my age there. But he was very nice, he invited me to Bible studies. And so I started coming to these little Bible, I knew nothing like, if you would have said to me, find the book of Exodus in the Bible, find the book of uh, John, the gospel of John. No, I couldn't have done anything. I couldn't tell you one thing about the Bible. So I start going and, and, and I have this buddy of mine. His name's Roger. And he's my main dope smoking buddy. So here's the now that the conflict really begins. I have not told anybody. I'm kind of embarrassed and I'm still smoking pot. So one day, I can't take it anymore. I'm riding with this guy. He's got a 59 dark green Volkswagen bug. We're going down the street. I said, Roger, I mean, this is the kind of stuff you think this could be in a movie. So I'm not making, I'm not exaggerating one bit. And what, and what age were you around this? What, in your 20s? I'm 18. 18, I'm 18. okay. We're both 18. I said, Roger, I have to tell you something. And he looked at me and he goes, no. He goes, Dave, I have to tell you something. I said, Roger, I said, I think what I'm going to tell you is going to blow your mind. He goes, no. He goes, I think what I'm going to tell you is going to blow your mind. His sister had had the same experience that my wife had had, had been talking to him. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's funny how. Hmm. Well, forgive me for that. No, that's all right. It's it's powerful what, what you went through. God shapes us through things like this. So anyway, he told me that he had, he had had this same experience. So I'm in shock. Like, I can hardly believe it. And I thought, so what are we going to do? So we both had a lid on us. We both had pot, right? We said, okay. We went to this guy's house. We went to his fireplace. We started a fire. We threw th these baggies in and we go, that's it. We're, we're done. We're done smoking. We're done doing drugs. I mean, I, I did other stuff, but I won't go into that. We're sure. done. Okay. So now I've got somebody. Like now I have a person that has experienced what I've experienced. I can share this with him. And now we're trying to find a church. So his sister invited us to go to this church that she went to. It was kind of a independent assembly God, kind of charismatic church, right? That's what was happening back in those days. And it was a really a booming deal. <clears throat> but I, I remember one night I went with, with all my buddies. Uh, there were about six of them in a, in a little group in this guy's apartment. And I told him what had happened. I told him I, I'd become a Christian. And I said, nothing personal. I just can't be hanging out with you guys anymore. My life's going in a different direction. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, you'll be back. You'll be, don't worry, we're not buying that. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what, what I thought at that point, but I just, I, I knew that I had to, my life had to go in a different direction. Okay, I don't want to belabor this too much, but um, what ends up happening is 
I'm involved in this church and it's, you know, band, praise band and all that kind of stuff in 1972 and three. And, you know, I thought this is, I guess this is how you worship Jesus. I, I just didn't have any frame of reference for that. So uh, I was going to go into broadcasting. So basically back in those days, disc jockeys, right? Where you spun records and you're on the radio. That's where I thought my life was headed. Um, when I finished up at Everett Community College, I, I, I just didn't feel like that's where I wanted to go. I had no desire to um, be a pastor. That, like, that thought never entered my mind at all. But uh, a, a fellow said to me, you, why don't you just come? Why don't you just go to a Bible college and just try to get some? I thought, well, okay, I don't know anything really about the Bible, about the scriptures, about the faith. I'll go there. So I, I went to this Bible college. And uh, my friend Roger also went there. And at the end, in the course of that time, I should go back and say that that girl that uh, talked to me about Jesus Christ, I ended up marrying her, right? So we dated that summer, then we didn't date all year. We dated the next summer, then we didn't date all year. And then we reunited again at this Bible college. And uh, we got engaged a couple months later and we got uh, married, uh, March 13th, uh, 1976. So just give you some, some perspective. Okay. So at the end of my junior year, no desire to become a pastor, zero. A buddy of mine that was graduating said, I just put your name in to become a youth pastor at this church up in it by where I live now. And I go, you did what, what, what do you mean? I'd never been to a youth group in my life. I didn't know what a youth group was. I just had zero experience. But anyway, uh, my wife and I went, we met with this uh, pastor and his wife, and he goes, you got the job, the job's yours. So they paid for me to finish my senior year. And they hired me on. And uh, all of a sudden, now I'm an assistant pastor in this evangelical Protestant kind of charismatic -y church. So my wife and I were already going through some issues uh, with Kind of the charismatic worship we just thought you know this is strange and it's but you know it's all we knew at that point so uh for whatever reason god blessed uh our ministry and all of a sudden we had this youth group we had 50 kids in it and we're just booming. 50 kids it was unbelievable it was just this shocking explosion of uh you know this in this church um did you so, like ministering to kids yeah, I've always connected with kids. Yeah, I like kids a lot, actually. Uh, yeah, all ages. Yeah. Uh, so that, but you know, uh, I, I wasn't like Mister Fun and Game. That was the funny part of it. I mean, we did fun things, but I always thought my responsibility was to teach them. Right. So, I don't know how you know. I don't know what other youth pastors do. To be honest, with I you. I kind of take that same approach too when I take when I teach Sunday school or I'm or I'm you know ministering to children, young adults, whatever. It's like you know I I, I try to yeah. keep their attention without um without boring them to death, and it's it's a funny balance like that. But whatever the case may be. Yeah. No. Exactly. Okay. So we'll we'll kind of speed up here. So no, nope, elaborate as much as you want. Don't feel like you're burning the clock here, please. Oh, okay. Well, so what ends up happening is um, my wife and I are really thinking this, we got to do something else. This is just not, we're not going to be in some kind of an assembly of God church. And so I started going to seminary. I went to Fuller Seminary. They had a branch campus at Seattle Pacific University. <clears throat> and uh, simultaneously, uh, I'd been at this church. This is the third year. The pastor resigned. And I was, at that point, I was only 25 years old. And they said, uh, a lot of people said, we want you to be the pastor of this church. And I thought, no, I don't think I'm ready to be the pastor of this church at all. <clears throat> but it, but I, we had um, nine, let's see, I guess we had 11 people on this board, church board. And I said, if it, in my head, if it's unanimous or if it's 10 to 1, I'll do it. But if it's nine to two, anything below that, I'm not going to do it because I don't want any division. Anyway, it ended up being nine to two. And I thought, nope, I, I have to go. I have to move on and do something else. So a very good friend of mine who uh, was an Assembly of God pastor, a lady came to him out of the blue and said, we need a pastor for our church. And our church is 
has a, some people that are charismatic, some people that are just kind of traditionally evangelical. And my buddy says, I've got the, I've got the perfect guy for you to, to, okay. So I get called to this church in Oso, Washington, little, little tiny, little burg, uh, and near near where I I live in the same house now that I lived in when I went to this church. But I, I went and they what they call it kind of candidated, you know, they interview you, you preach a sermon, do they like you? So anyway, for whatever reason, they liked me. And uh, they said, we want you to have the job. OK, so when I went there, we had 30 people and uh, I was there for seven years. And for whatever reason, by the grace of God, we just grew and grew we had a small building and we grew to 140 people on a Sunday morning. But, but what's happening to me in the midst of this seven year period is a uh, sort of a shocking change. And I realized that I'm beginning to move away from typical evangelical Protestant beliefs. So at that point, <clears throat> I was teaching in a private Christian school, an evangelical Christian school that was multi-denomination, <clears throat> Lutherans, Baptists, Christian Reform, I mean, you know, you name it. <clears throat> and uh, I was teaching church history. It was one of the things I taught. And the librarian uh, at that school was a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor <clears throat> who was fluent in Greek. And he said to me, uh, Pastor Dave, what they call me, you know, I said, Pastor Dave, he goes, you have to get into the Greek because he knew I was really struggling with infant baptism because we didn't practice infant baptism. <clears throat> but as I'm studying church history, I'm realizing, and this was a little bit of a, a, a crisis. This is a little cathartic for me because I realized what I am reading about in the early Christian church does not resemble what I am experiencing as an evangelical Protestant pastor. Uh, this was 1987, 88, 89, right? That period right there. <clears throat> but I didn't know what to do with that. I just thought, well, times change. I guess the Holy Spirit is moving differently, you know, today than he did. <clears throat> but he, he, he said to me, you have to go study the Greek. So <clears throat> I began to try and study the New Testament to the best of my ability. But I also began to read the church fathers. And as I began to do that, which, which it's funny, right? Because, I mean, I'm a seminary grad, but in most Protestant seminaries, they're not very patristic. You know, church history is just a semester uh, of the early church, a semester of polity in your own church. And, and you don't really um, study them in depth at all. I had the same experience with the Bible college I went to as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was even fuller seminary. So they just was very, you know, they just sort of glossed over it till you got to the what's happening now phase. Okay. So what ends up happening to me is I reach these four beliefs. And once you believe these four things, you realize you're no longer an evangelical Protestant. So here's the four things. Number one, the church had always practiced infant baptism. Uh oh. Number two, the church had always worshiped with some kind of a liturgical format. People just didn't make it up and meet in homes and, and spontaneous worship. <clears throat> Number three, the church always believed that the consecrated bread and wine were the body and blood of Christ. And number four, the church always had bishops. Well, when you reach those four conclusions, you are no longer an evangelical Protestant pastor. So now I am in a complete crisis, right? Not so much a crisis of faith, but a crisis of where do I go from here? What do I do with this, right? Because if I'm going to keep my job, do I ignore this? Do I pretend I didn't read this and study this? And, and so <clears throat> it might seem like it would be an easy thing to resolve, but but for me, the, the question was this, should I resign and just pursue this myself? And, and believe me, at this point, no exposure to orthodoxy whatsoever. <clears throat> um, at this point, I, I realized that the, the line of demarcation really was a sacramental versus a non-sacramental view of the church. 
And I was crossing this line now into a sacramental view. So I thought my options were Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism of some sort, or Anglicanism, the Episcopal Church. Did you but, know anything about the Orthodox Church and even its existence at this point? Zero. No, so I'm going to tell this is a really, <laughs> believe me, this story as it unfolds is, is kind of incredible. <clears throat> so I, now I'm, I'm in a little bit of a crisis and I'm thinking, what, what am I going to do? So what ends up happening is at this point, this is 1987. In 1987, uh, we're trying to expand this building we're in and we are landlocked. Nobody will sell us any property. There was a, a big old uh, schoolhouse in the area. We thought we could move there and remodel it, but it was a historical uh, landmark, so we couldn't do anything to it. And then we thought, well, I thought, well, let's relocate. We'll move closer to where I live now, Arlington. But the old timer said, no, we're not. We're not going to move. And I realized at that point that I was heading in a very different direction than this church was heading in. So I decided that I was going to plant a church on the other side of Arlington. In other words, a half hour, 40 minutes away, and uh, they would just have to call somebody else to be the pastor of that church. So in 1987, um, on Mother's Day of 1987, uh, we started what's called Grace Community Church. We met in a school. We met in a school called Lakewood High School. And again, we had about 30 people, okay, 30 people. And uh, over the course of three years, for whatever reason, we just had this phenomenal growth. We, we grew to 110 families. So we outgrew their little theater. We had to move into the lunchroom, the commons area. And we had about 250 people every Sunday for worship. But now I'm in the midst of this. So we've, we've shifted our worship so it looked more like a Lutheran or a Presbyterian kind of church. But the more I'm reading, the more I'm, I'm realizing we have to change even more. Okay, so, so this is what I want you to understand. So our trajectory had been like this, just growth, growth, growth. And I decided, because it was a little bit of a conflict, that I was going to teach a class on church history for our church. And I thought, well, who's going to want to come to that, really? Because I had a guy cancel on me for the adult Sunday school, right? But anyway, lo and behold, almost every adult in the church came to this class. I thought, well, this is incredible. I said, I'm going to really do my best to, to talk about the early church and help understand the fathers. And three weeks into this class, a woman uh, gives me this book. Her name's Sandy. And she gave me this book, um, Becoming Orthodox, A Journey to the Ancient Christian Faith by Father Peter Gilquist. Now, she gave it to me not because of the title, Becoming Orthodox, but because of the subtitle, A Journey to the Ancient Christian Faith. She goes, I think this might be something that, that Father Dave wants to read or Pastor Dave wants to read. So she gives me this book. And, you know, I haven't had too many shocking experiences in my life. But but this book was a shock to me because every pastor that I knew, and, and I'd been the president of the Arlington Ministerial Association. I mean, I knew all the pastors in the area and all of them were moving more contemporary. I was meeting with a group of Missouri Synod pastors and all of a sudden, in, this is about 1990, there's this movement to be contemporary. And so what happened in all these mainline denominations uh, Methodist, Lutheran, you know, Presbyterian, they all had a traditional service, but they had a contemporary service because they were losing people. And they thought the way to keep people is to, to rock it a little bit, uh, whatever that looked like in that context. So I was so bummed out because I'm thinking the reason I would want to become a Lutheran or a, an Anglican is because of liturgy, like a historic liturgical form. All right. So what ends up happening? I read this book. I am in absolute shock because it's the story of these 20 churches around the country, these guys from Campus Crusade for Christ that had all resigned to try and understand. Because, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but they'd had these rallies all over the United States in these colleges. 
And all these people were coming forward like a Billy Graham kind of crusade. But when they followed up on them three, four, five years later, hardly any of these people were going to church. So they said, Was this the Campus Crusaders movement or my yeah, favorite? Yes, okay, the Campus yeah. Crusade movement. So, so, um, they said, we've got to, we got to figure this out. This isn't working. So all the leadership, except for Bill Bright, who was the head guy, resigned. And they went on this journey, right? This 20-year journey from 1967 to 1987. And in 1987, 17 of those 20 churches were received into the Antiochian Archdiocese, right? Oh. Yeah. I mean, and they, they talked to the Greeks. They talked to others. But nobody was willing to take a chance like that except Metropolitan Philip. Saliba. Okay, so now that was in 1987. I'm reading this book in September of 1990. I'm in such absolute shock because this journey is my entire journey, except for one section, the section on Mary and the saints. I had absolutely zero frame of reference for Mary and for the saints at all. But I thought I've, I've got to I got to talk to this author. So anyway, I called Father Peter Gilquist and I got his daughter, and she said, "I'll have my dad call you right away." The next day, he calls me, and we just had this incredible conversation. And he said, "I want you to do me a favor." He said, "I want you to go meet a new priest that's been assigned down by you, named Father James Bernstein." Okay. Well, okay. Who's Father James Bernstein? Sounds familiar. He's really familiar. Yeah. Um, he, he's, um, uh, written a very, uh, wonderful book, several, um, uh, pamphlets for, uh, uh, explaining, uh, parts of the faith. <clears throat> but what's significant about Father James Bernstein was that he was raised uh, in an Orthodox family in Queens, uh, New York, and secretly converted from being Jewish to a Christian when he was 16 his parents uh tried to deprogram him they sent him a deprogrammer he was jewish orthodox you mean and then he eventually came he was over. jewish <laughs> jewish jewish right uh, yeah orthodox jew yeah right although his family wasn't practicing now but i'm saying that's the lineage right and um he becomes a secret christian because he knew his parents would go crazy if they found out well they did find out and they did go crazy and they took him to a deprogrammer that didn't work they decided to send him to a kibbutz in uh israel and the day he landed the six-day war broke out um they didn't they didn't reconvert him over there he comes back uh, i'm i'm just going through this quickly but anyway he eventually uh meets uh, moshe rosen and he becomes one of the founders of jews for jesus so he's an evangelical protestant he's out on the west coast uh, in berkeley uh, kind of this whole hippie movement. They're baptizing people in the fountain at, at University of California. But my point is, he had been an evangelical Protestant, and he uh, was with this group, but he left the group before they became Orthodox, Gilquist group, and he went to St. Vladimir Seminary, and he became ordained a priest. And this was the first parish that he was assigned to. So <clears throat> I'm just saying God in his providence realized me coming from all these years of being an evangelical Protestant. I needed somebody that understood my struggles. Like, like what was I going through? <clears throat> so I, I met with Father James. He loaded me up with books. Uh, I, I began to read like I'd never read before. But then he said to me, I want you to meet all the other priest in the state of Washington. I want you to go and meet the Greeks. I want you to meet you know, the Serb. I want you to meet the, the, uh, the Russians. And so I began to do that. I began to go and meet. So I won't tell you who this priest is. It doesn't really matter. But the first priest, beside Father James, I met, he said to me, why do you want to convert? He goes, you're already a pastor. He goes, just, just continue on what you're doing. That was shocking to me. Like that was That was discouraging to me because I thought, Am I am I misreading this? I mean, what's going on here? But he was the only one that responded that way. All these other people that I met, most of them had been converts. Uh, but I met a, a Greek priest in Seattle, Father Steve Seclis, who's now down in Irvine, California. And he was really a wonderful uh, help to me. He, he said, uh, 
he, he, he sensed that I was very sincere about this. And he said, I'm going to allow you to do something that we've never allowed anybody else to do in the history of the Washington Orthodox Clergy Association. <clears throat> he goes, I want you to start attending the meetings with these priests. Just keep your mouth shut. Just don't speak. Just attend and be quiet. Okay. So let me think about this, how old I am now. Um, I'm 36 years old. 36 years old. <clears throat> I go to this meeting just to get this experience. I'm meeting these other priests. I meet Father Mel Jamaica, Father Joseph Copeland, <clears throat> um, and Father Vadim Pogrebniak. And all these people were very kind to me. They, they, they and, and you know, at this point, a lot of people weren't converting, like, and whole churches weren't converting. This is just a funny phenomenon. So now I'm saying to myself again, is my responsibility to just leave and figure this out on my own? Or is my responsibility to teach this to the people regardless of the consequences? Well, I concluded it was the latter. Now, this was an easy decision for me to make, but that's what I did. So remember I said to you, we were going like this? Mm -hmm. Well, once I began to teach this church history class, they all were nodding their heads. Yeah, yeah, man, that makes sense. That seems great. But the second I began to implement any kind of change in our worship format the growth stopped okay and so for example I'll just give you an example uh protestant protestants don't have uh evangelical protestants don't have altars right? sure. they have communion tables right <clears throat> and so on our communion table i put a couple of candles just a couple of candles you see almost in any mainline denominational church that got people nervous like what are you doing why, why are you doing this and then I put like a decorative covering over it and put the candles on top of that. And then it was like, well, this seems like it's kind of Lutheran. Seems like it's kind of, uh, and at that point, I'm meeting with three groups now, the Orthodox monthly, the Missouri Synod monthly, and a group of conservative Anglicans, uh, Episcopalians quarterly. So I'm still not sure I'm going to become Orthodox. It's just all of a sudden this, this is on the table now. And so, um, our growth begins to stagnate. We're not, we're not growing anymore, and we're starting to lose a few people. And uh, the more I began to make changes, the more I became more traditional in what our worship looked like on a Sunday morning, uh, we began to lose people. So uh, over the course of three years, we went from averaging 250 people on a Sunday morning to 160 people on a Sunday morning. Well, I had four kids. My wife uh, stayed home to raise our kids. She didn't work. And when you start losing people, there's usually only one place to cut in a church. And that's the priest. That's the pastor's salary, correct? Mm. And so that had to happen. So now what's happening is I am teaching in a private Christian school. I'm uh, refereeing wrestling, high school and junior high ref wrestling to make money. And I become a prison chaplain. We had a prison by us and I became a, a part-time prison chaplain just to keep food on the table. <clears throat> and I'm not quite sure where my wife's at in this journey, right? She's just, she, it's really complicated because when people leave, some of these people are your friends and they're leaving. And now you're, you're, you're thinking, what in the world? Like, why are you doing this? So it makes you ask a question, right? Is this just a preference or is this a conviction? And that may seem like an easy question to answer, but am I just doing this because, because it's I'm on a, out on a whim or do I really believe this? And the more I'm studying this, the more I realize it's orthodoxy. Because believe me, it would have been easy if I had transitioned into an Anglican setting or a Lutheran setting, we probably would have hardly lost anybody. <clears throat> but as we begin to, and I, and I invited speakers to come, I had priests come. And we talked about iconography. We talked about venerate, all these things. And people are getting more and more nervous. People are leaving. So I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because I, I feel like it's important to be honest, to help people understand what a monumental struggle it is for sometimes for evangelical Protestants to convert. Because to, to even become more traditional as an evangelical Protestant, you're going to get grief from your family and your friends because they think you're somehow compromised. But to become orthodox, 
is a mind blow. Like they cannot comprehend what you're doing. And so they're not even sure you're a Christian. <clears throat> so we had people that were getting so much heat from their families about why are you listening to this stuff and reading this? Okay. <clears throat> so here's what, here's the ugly part. Um, this is August uh, of uh, 1993, August 1993. I had, we had 10 people come to our church board meeting on a Tuesday night. And I had made this decision that in order to receive communion, you had to be baptized. Doesn't that seems like a crazy, simple thing? Was but that not the was that not the norm in no, Protestant? No, really? No, no. In evangelical Protestant churches, if you want to be baptized, that's up to you. It's just between you and God, right? And, and so, uh, I mean, there are certain denominations that require it now, but I'm just talking about just mainline non-denominational evangelical Protestant. No. That's just a because all it is is just basically your testimony that you um, have committed your life to Jesus, right? Sure. So uh, these people came, and they were all kind of from a Baptist background, and and they were really angry. Like most of the people that left up to this point just didn't get it. We go, you know, Pastor Dave, we don't know what you're doing. Uh, it just seems kind of crazy to us, but th they weren't angry. This group was really mad. And I, I think I had underestimated how much tension there was in the, the church at that point, in, in the, I won't call it a parish, but you know. Okay, so this is a Tuesday night, and I said to them, all right, I'm going to have a meeting on Sunday night. This is August 29th, right? It was almost my beheading. I didn't, I didn't know it was the beheading of John the Baptist, <clears throat> but uh, the church, and, and we'd moved into a building now, the building we're still in right now, we'd been remodeling it, and it was a very nice little building, it's packed, and I set a table uh, up in the front, and I was trying to explain to them what my vision is for the future now, and uh, I set the scriptures in the middle, I set a stack of church fathers on one side, and we had um, some little paper bylaws, right, that I set on the other side. And so my point was, we've come together, we're a group of people, we're trying to love God, and we're very well intentioned in putting together our statement of faith, our bylaws, and all of that. But what is going to be the determining factor uh, as to how we're going to understand the scriptures and, and, and you know, the church? I said, it's, you know, for me, I've come to the conclusion that several of the things in our statement of faith are historically inaccurate, like they're not correct. And here's this whole stack of church fathers. And we can go back to the beginning of the church and we can say, this is what the church believed. This is how the church practiced their faith. <clears throat> and um, so I'm, and I, I tell them that I'm going to, we're going to start celebrating, you know, even though it was Protestant, we're going to start celebrating communion weekly. I'm going to start wearing a form of vestment that was be sort of like what an Anglican priest might wear <clears throat> or a Lutheran pastor. And well, anyway, now this meeting is at a fever pitch. I mean, it is like you just cut the, the air the with tension a with a knife. Yep. Oh, man, it was. Yeah. <clears throat> and in the middle of this, my wife gets called out and I hear this. Oh, no. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I thought one of my kids had been killed. Like I knew, I knew something really terrible, but that, that cry had happened. I didn't know what it was. So somebody came back in and they said, my oldest daughter had just driven down to the church. She'd gotten a call that my wife's dad had just dropped dead of a heart attack, 64 years old, completely unexpected out of the blue. And so I said, okay, one of your parishioners wives. No, my wife's dad. My oh, wife's your wife's dad. dad. My father-in-law. Okay. Sorry. Oh, my Sorry. goodness. Okay. Yeah. My father -in -law just dropped dead of a heart attack. So this is a Sunday night. I said, I'm sorry. We have to stop the meeting. I said, I'm going to go be with my wife. I, I have to, you know, be with her. So we'll resume this on Tuesday night. Okay. So now, not knowing that I'm going to have to do my father-in-law's funeral on Wednesday. So this, this was hell week for me. Like the Navy SEALs, there's hell week. <clears throat> this was my hell week. <clears throat> so on Tuesday, the church is even more packed because people are making phone calls so that some of the people that left had come back because they wanted to see what the outcome of this meeting was going to be. 
<clears throat> so um, in the end, I laid all this out and we had to vote. And you had to be a uh, 18 years old, a voting member to cast a vote. And I thought if it's 50-50, if it's 60-40, I'm just going to stop. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to split this church. I, I won't do it. But anyway, we took the vote and it ended up being 81 to 19. 81, 19. We're for you. We're with you. 81. We, we, we share the vision. Let's go. I was actually a little bit surprised by that. And this you know, and this vote was for what particular actions? Just everything I just laid out. Like okay, numbers. yeah. I'm so all of that. Communion. Okay. Uh, you have to be baptized to receive communion. All of that, yeah. Right. And when when I announced that uh, total, those uh, ten people stood up, and and a couple others. They were so angry. I mean, they were mad. They just were furious. You know, we'll never set foot in this church again. And they left. Okay, but those those ten people with their children represented fifty people. So, so remember now, in three years, we've gone from 250 to 160. In one week, we went from 160 to 110. Wow. So imagine a third of your congregation going, nope, I'm not doing it. We're not, I'm not going to explore orthodoxy. Forget it. <clears throat> now, what, what I'm telling you is not atypical. I mean, this is, it's just that there aren't very many whole churches that try and and I've been telling you, this is why they, they probably don't do it, because it is hell to do it. <clears throat> okay, so now, obviously, my salary is cut even more, right? And so I'm just, it's fine. I'm not, I mean, I'm not complaining about any of that. I'm just letting you know that I, I'm juggling all these things to try and keep my family fed and keep my head above water. And um, But these factors weren't exactly encouraging to the continuation of this. This was like, you know, one truck hit to the motivation after another, I'm sure. <laughs> Yes, but 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 what but was happening though? Here's the other interesting thing. We start having a few families come from the outside because they were so turned off at what was happening in evangelical Protestantism. They began to be interested in what we were doing. So it was a very funny phenomenon. And so at this point, I'm not quite sure where my wife's at in this whole deal. My wife's name's Debbie. Okay, Korea Deborah. And uh, one Saturday more, because because a lot of her friends had left, right? I mean, people that we were close to that we'd hung out with, and boom, they're just gone. Like it's like a divorce or a death. So um, I'm we're in the, this room, uh, and my wife's sitting over on a couch, and I'm in a recliner. It's a Saturday morning. I'm reading the sports page, and I never forget it. And out of the blue, my wife says, "I get it, you know." And I thought, uh, what? And she goes, I get orthodoxy. So I put the newspaper down and she said, it's just that it is so hard to make this transition. And I tell you that my heart leaped for joy because I realized, okay, okay, <clears throat> it is hard, but at least we're on the same page. Like now we get it. Here we go. <clears throat> so, um, about a year, uh, or so later, her best friend, one of her best friends from college, came up just to say, we want to hang out for the weekend. And in the course of this, she was trying to talk us out of orthodoxy. And she didn't tell us that when she came up, right? What was but that the, like? Well, no. So in the course of the conversation, I started talking about her church, her experience in this Baptist church <clears throat> down in Santa Maria, California. And it was miserable. She was She hated it. And I said to her, Tricia, listen to me. I said, there's an Orthodox church down by you, the church in Ben Loman. And at that point, it was, you know, really a going concern. I said, you need to go there and visit. So the next Sunday, she went and visited. And they were starting a brand new uh, OCA mission in Santa Maria. She went there the next Sunday. She actually became Orthodox a year before we did. Oh, and my goodness. She became my wife's sponsor when we came in. Isn't that funny? That's just a great story. Funny how she it works. She tries to talk us out of it, and she ends up becoming Orthodox. Yeah, many was... such cases. Yeah. So, so he, I'll, I'll now I'm going to just sort of jump ahead um, to October of 1995. So, the group that came in in 1987, 
They were called the AEOM, the Antiochian Evangelical Orthodox Mission. <clears throat> and they were overseen by Bishop Basil. And uh, Father James Bernstein, starting in 1990, invited me to these annual meetings. And uh, in 1995, they decided they were no longer going to meet because they were kind of going in two different directions. And there was one group that had been exposed to the monastic life. Uh, they visited monasteries, had gone to Russia, et cetera. And the other group really wasn't going along. So I'm at the very last meeting that they're having. It's in this uh, Episcopal retreat center, about 45 minutes outside of Jackson, Mississippi. Okay, so I'm not one of these people that, you know, I pray and I hear voices or, you know, it's just, <clears throat> but, but this was to me anyway, uh, it may not seem very miraculous, but to me, this is a very miraculous moment. There's a big pond outside this, uh, in this retreat center. And I'm all by myself and I'm walking around it. And I, I realize we've just got to become Orthodox. I mean, this is it. We, we you know, we're just, we got to pull the trigger. Even though I'm thinking there's, we're going to lose more people if I, if I finally pull that trigger. So I said, God, please, you have to show me, just help me to understand, like, what am I, how, how do I approach this? And, and is this the right time? And I mean, I was tearful. It was really, hmm. Okay. Funny how you relive, <laughs> relive these things. Anyway, okay, so I pray this prayer, and the very next day, it's the last day of the conference, so we're at the uh, Antiochian Orthodox Church, uh, Father John Henderson in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm the only non-Orthodox person in here. All these priests are there, right? Uh, Bishop Basil is serving, and I'm in the very back row, and I'm, and just, I'm just standing there, just trying to take it in and just trying to discern, like, what am I going to do here? And right before they came out with the gifts, Father James Bernstein comes out the outside of the church and he comes back to me and he takes my hand and he puts a piece of on in my hand. And he said, I've got a message for you from the bishop. I said, you got a message for me from the bishop? He goes, the next time he sees you, he said, it better be on the other side of the iconostasis. <laughs> like get ordained, right? That's well, so cool. No, it, it was shocking to me because I thought, okay, I, I, I asked God to give me some kind of clear direction. Kaboom. And and nobody knew I offered this prayer up, right? Just, just between me and God. So I went back, <clears throat> I waited a couple of weeks, I mustered up uh, courage. And on one Sunday morning, I just sort of recounted our whole journey as a group. And I said, we have to become Orthodox. This is it. We, we've studied this. And so um, by the grace of God uh, and the, the really the generosity of St. Paul, uh, Antiochian Orthodox Church, where Father James Bernstein was, <clears throat> they let him come up every other week and catechize us for nine months. <clears throat> so I would take one week, he'd take the next week, back and forth, back and forth, just this very serious Orthodox catechism. And then um, we met with then Bishop Joseph. And um, so there was a funny little time period where there was about three parishes that came into the Orthodox Church. Uh, and uh, the church down in uh, Cupertino in um, San Jose, St. Stephen's Orthodox Church, they came in like maybe a month and a half before we did. <clears throat> but um, so, so here's what ended up happening. We were going to come in on February 8th, 1997. And the week before, I got a call from the major newspaper in Seattle, the Seattle Times. And they said, we'd like to come up and do a story because somehow they got wind. I don't know how they found out about our conversion, but they thought it was just weird enough because most people are becoming more contemporary and here we are becoming more traditional and ancient. And so she said, can we do a story? I said, yeah, come on up. And she, you know, took pictures on a Sunday morning 
And I, I think it's going to go in the religion section the next Saturday. Somebody calls me up on Monday morning. And they said, have you seen the front page of the Seattle Times? I go, the front no. page. what? And uh, boom, big two-page spread. It got picked up by the Boston Globe. It just got picked up by newspapers all over the country. So then the major newspaper in our county, which is called the Everett Herald, not to be outdone, they said, hey, can we come up and do a story? So they came up during the week. And on that Saturday uh, that we're going to be received in as a group, we got a two-page color spread talking about our conversion. And so then because of the Seattle Times uh, front page article, uh, one of the local news, uh, the TV stations called us up and they said, can we film this? And so we just got in a press just because of the oddity of an evangelical church converting to orthodoxy. Just a ton of exposure all at once. Yeah. Huh? So, so that was, in, that was the positive exposure. <clears throat> the interesting, the negative exposure was uh, one of the guys that converted with us, his parents went to a Baptist church in an adjacent town and his uh, pastor that morning uh that sunday morning preached against orthodoxy and how we were deluded and getting sucked into the, yeah so and so i should tell you this this is an interesting part of the backstory let me take a little drink here i had been um in arlington where i live between the church and also in this great community church for about 17 years and i knew all the pastors and you know i think we're all friends <clears throat> but in the end um there's only two people that supported me in this journey all the other guys really flipped out and they thought i had flipped <clears throat> they thought orthodoxy was a, a cult they just they didn't know anything about icon i mean they're just ignorant i'm not blaming them and they're just just ignorant about church history um and like i was ignorant at some point so, but the Catholic priest, the Roman Catholic priest, and the Lutheran pastor, um, they they were supportive, interestingly enough, uh, on this journey. No kidding. Yeah, you know, yeah, yep. Uh, now today, I'll tell you what's happened. Over the course of time, uh, most of those guys have, have died off, and we've got new guys, and I've had them, people come to the church, and I've given them tours. So even though I don't think they're enthusiastic, they're not hostile. They're, they're, maybe they're they're neutral at this point, uh, or they're polite until, if anything. Yeah. They're, they're neutral until we get somebody from their church to come over their parish. Th then they're not so neutral. Okay, sure. so what ends up happening is uh, this is such a big deal that they invite priests from uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and uh, British Columbia to come down and all be part of receiving us into the church. So Bishop Joseph, uh, I'm ordained a deacon on Saturday the 8th, and um, everybody was in a different line to be chrismated, okay? <clears throat> and uh, it, so I'm, I'm deacon for one day, deacon for a day, and the next day I'm ordained to the priesthood. Now, believe me, <clears throat> I, I'm like a deer in the headlights. As I look back now, I, I should not have been ordained. I mean, I just, I wasn't prepared to be a priest. But in when these whole churches converted, their thinking was, we can't take the shepherd away. In other words, this has been such a traumatic journey for these people. Um, and, and because I at least was a, a seminary graduate, uh, we have a thing called the St. Stephen's course. And so I had to attend that, et cetera. <clears throat> and so for me, it was on the job training right? On the job training. And uh, uh, so we, we brought it. So we had 104 people. So to give you the final numbers now, here's this. So a six and a half year journey. We started with 110 families. We ended up with 104 people, 33 families. And about 13 of those families had come along. So out of the 110 original families, only 20 made that transition into orthodoxy but we got to keep our building and that was really a huge deal is is incredible we got to do that <clears throat> okay so now i'll just I'll, I'll tell you one more little thing and then you can go where you want to go with this uh i because 
I had not been trained very well liturgically. Uh, I went down to, C uh, to Seattle and my friend, Steve Seclise, like right when I came into the church, he got transferred to California. So they had a new priest up there, uh, Father John Hondros. And I, I'm not a, a person that's uh, embarrassed to say I don't know something. I mean, just I'm, I want help and I ask a lot of questions. So I went down to Father John Hondros and I said, I need you to teach me how to serve, how to serve liturgy. Because sometimes some of the AUM guys, they had some quirky things they did. And I just wanted to really serve in a traditional way. <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to come back and talk about one more thing before we go on about monasticism. <clears throat> but um, I went down there and he says, OK, you're going to be my assistant priest. You're just going to be the assistant and I'll serve and we'll serve together. And we did that. Uh, almost every week for uh, a few months. And then he said, okay, now you're going to serve and I'm going to be the assistant and I'm going to critique you. So I, I'm just saying uh, in my life, there were many people that helped me, many, many kind priests that maybe they took pity on me. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that, that's just one example. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny story, like Father Mel Jamaica, in the midst of my journey uh, into orthodoxy, he said to me, you're going to think that the issue is, what about icons? What about veneration? What about the saints? What about vestments? What about incense? What about, I go, yeah, yeah, I go, that's the issue. He goes, no, he goes, that's not the issue. <laughs> the issue is, what is the church? Now, I didn't know what he meant by that. Like, like in other words, I just, I sort of nodded my head. Oh, I see. It's about the church. But what I discovered was of those 17 churches that came in in 1987, he was the last one. And uh, he was, I believe, at Holy Cross Seminary. And this uh, priest back there, had because he wasn't sure he was going to come in. He wasn't sure. And the priest had this conversation with him. And he, and he really helped him to understand it's the church. Like, what is the church? And so now, um, when, when I catechize people, <clears throat> I, I, I approach it this very same way. I go, you're going to think it's all about this, and they're all nodding their head. I go, no, it's about the church. And once you figure out what the church is, historically, what is this body, this entity, I said, then everything else will fall into place for you. And so one other example is um, <clears throat> Father... Uh, uh, Joseph Copeland. I went over to see Father Joseph Copeland, and he was meeting this little small building. He has a just a beautiful, he just retired now, but has just a beautiful uh, parish in Yakima, Washington. But he was in this small little church, and uh, he said, uh, do you have a cross? I go, well, no. He said, why not? I go, I don't I don't know. I mean, I never wore, why would I wear a cross? I'm, I'm a, he goes, here, here's a cross. He goes, do you have an icon? I said, well, no, I know I don't have an icon. So he gives this icon of Jesus, and he must have seen the look on my face. And he goes, what do you think is going to happen? I said, I don't know what's going to happen. He goes, well, just set it up. Say your prayers in front of it. If you don't like it, just set it down and fine. But anyway, it was a very funny, those kind of experiences where guys were um, bold, that's, right? I think that's the word. They weren't afraid to say, listen, you, know, you got to sort of step out of your comfort zone here. But Father Copeland did something that really changed my life. He said to me, you need to go over to Goldendale, Washington, and meet these three nuns that have just moved there from Greece. Okay, so this is 1995. And uh, I knew nothing. I mean, I'd read a few things about monasticism, but had zero exposure. <clears throat> so I drive over, and and, in, and now it's a really a thriving the booming monster with like 30 nuns and beautiful Catholicon. And it's just incredible. But then they had this kind of metal little Quonset hut thing. And I, I knock on the door and uh, one of the sisters, I think it was sister Agni that answered, but it, it could have been sister Parthia. I can't remember at this point. <clears throat> and they barely spoke English. And they said, well, you know, who are you? Like, because I, I didn't look, I didn't have a cassock on. Right. And anyway, I introduced myself. But that began a, a connection, not just with that monastery, but with monasticism in particular. So, 
you know, for me, and so when I say these things, I don't want anybody to think I'm being critical of anybody else. I'm, I'm this is my journey. Of course. And, and, you know, like, like evangelical Protestantism, like I, I'm, I don't poo poo all of that. I, I just say God used all of those things in my life to bring me to this place where I discovered the ancient Christian faith. Uh, and and so in with in with orthodoxy, I began to see that there seemed to be kind of two streams in, in American orthodoxy. I didn't have any overseas exposure, so I can only draw from what I what I uh, am exposed to. We got our own fish to fry in Greece. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I've yeah, been there now. Me. No, now I realize that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but I realized that uh, it seemed to me that there were those uh, who were uh, wearing their cassocks, were visiting monasteries. Um, you talk about spiritual fathers. And, and then there were those that, um, you know, open collared shirts and a tab collar and, you know, smoking cigars or cigarettes and, so I'm not being and, and I know you're not being critical, but yeah. in concern to like the clergy or like what what do you mean particularly? I'm talking clergy. Okay. Clergy at this point. Yeah, exclusively clergy. And so I I had friends in both those groups. And and there are people in both those groups that are very nice, very helpful to me. But uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as I began to be exposed to the monastic world. I, I saw myself drifting in a certain direction <clears throat> and becoming more traditional in that way. So I had uh, a very good friend of mine, Father Alexander Addy. And uh, Father Addy died. He died rather young. I think he was about 62 when he reposed, um, really uh, memory eternal. He just was a great guy. But he had a very strong personality and he could be opinionated. And he could rub people the wrong way. But for whatever reason, <clears throat> I think because he and I were kind of jocks and we used to like to work out when we'd go on trips, we just connected. So for some reason, he and I connected. <clears throat> and so I'd heard he'd been sent down to Louisville, Kentucky to close this church down because it was this dying church. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, he transformed this thing into one of the most dynamic churches in the United States. He had eight and 900 people there on a Sunday morning. So I thought to myself, I have to see this. Like, I, I just have to experience what's going on here. What do you mean by dynamic? What was so particularly special about this parish? Okay, here, the dynamic was they were doing daily services. So oh. when I came into the Antiochian Archdiocese, Greeks, Serbs, Antiochians, OCA, you name it, they basically did feast days and Sundays, right? Tragically, but yes. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe a few would do Saturday night Vespers and get a really low turnout. <clears throat> so daily services just weren't part of this because there was hardly any monastic presence, right? Uh, you don't know, Frem hadn't come here. So, <clears throat> but, but he, so here's his story. This is just a, such a remarkable story. <clears throat> I said, I, I, I said, I want to fly back because we had a meeting up in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I want to come to your church in Louisville, Kentucky. Then we'll drive together up to this conference. Okay. <clears throat> so I fly in there. And at this point, not only does he have this gigantic St. Michael's church that he's built. <clears throat> and I mean, on a Sunday morning, there I was packed 900 people. I mean, it was shocking to me to see this many people. <clears throat> and, but the thing that was even more shocking was they had built this chapel that was maybe uh, 35 by 35. And it was a really a good sized chapel where they had daily services. And he began to tell me why he did this. So Father uh, Alexander used to weigh about 325 pounds. <clears throat> and he went to uh, this Father Isaac, who was an Antiochian uh, monk on Mount Athos, and he wanted to ask him to be his spiritual father. And so he went there and he said, I, you know, I'd like you to be my spiritual father. I'm paraphrasing now. <clears throat> but uh, he looked at him and he said, you want me to be your spiritual father? He goes, a fat priest is no priest. What? He goes, a fat priest is no priest. 
He goes, you got to lose weight. No kidding. He goes, I'm not going to be your spiritual father if you don't lose weight. Now, from the time I met Father Alexander Addy, he was about 175 pounds. He lost it and he never put it back on. Thank God. You know, but then he said to him, he goes, are you a typical Antiochian? Are, are you a typical American priest? <clears throat> do you just do services on Sundays and feast days? <clears throat> Pardon this cough. No, you're and he goes, well, yeah, that's what I do. And he goes, no. He goes, if I'm going to be your spiritual father, you're going to start doing daily services. And, and believe me, nobody did them back then. <clears throat> so Father Alexander comes back and he starts doing these daily services. And he told me, he said at times, he goes many times, it was just me and the chanter, me and the chanter. But he was faithful and he started to do this. <clears throat> so, so my exposure was, after he'd been doing this for many years, the fruit of this <clears throat> in, in his church life was incredible. <clears throat> so everybody had an electronic key. They could go into that chapel whenever they wanted. They could pray privately, but he, but he did these daily services. So that inspired me. Like I thought, we have to start doing daily services. <clears throat> so I come back to our church and I'm trying to think, this is about maybe 2006, 2007. I just, I'm not exactly sure. But more recent history. Yeah, you're, yeah, recent, more recent. <clears throat> and uh, off our, uh, in this remodel we did, off one of our transepts uh, where the choir sang, we had these three classrooms. <clears throat> and each of these classrooms was about 10 by 10. And I decided to tear down the wall and make a 20 by 10 foot chapel. We had a guy in our church that built an iconostasis and it was an Athenite style. So the altar was up against the back wall. You know, you couldn't go around it. <clears throat> and I thought we're just going to start having tried, have some daily services. Wow. It just caught on so much. And so then we knocked out the other wall and we got Stasidi from Greece and we began, and, and you know, I had chanters that were willing to do this. <clears throat> so today, this, you know, in a normal week for me, we have a liturgy Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Tuesday and Thursday, we have Orthros before liturgy. <clears throat> um, and 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 we can do any other services in that chapel, but it's it's transformed the life of our church. I had a lady come from a different jurisdiction <clears throat> and she, she's a member now, but she said, I've never been a, with a church that had this many services. I said, well, I said, part of it is I'm old, right? I don't have little kids I have to watch. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm in a good space in life where I'm free. But but the other key is we have these chanters that also love the services and they want to do them. <clears throat> so I, I'm saying all of that, like my exposure to Father Alexander, because I started doing this when nobody was, hardly anybody was doing these daily services. Now, a lot of people are like a lot of my friends in the Antiochian Archdiocese, and I have really a, a, a tight group of priest friends. Uh, we all do services throughout the week. So it's just sort of normative. Now, I'm not saying across the whole archdiocese, but in, in my little group, sure, uh, it's, it's normative. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that sort of brought me to the place where I am today. Um, and, you know, why I dress the way I do, uh, why I have so many services, because <clears throat> I've come to believe that this is the, what a priest life is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about the services and prayer. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> the story, you just had a roller coaster. It's like you, you went from being, you know, in a charitable, I could say this, an agnostic mm -hmm. all the way over to eventually accepting Christ into you know, traditionally educating yourself about Christianity into the Orthodox Church to be a priest and not only yeah. a priest, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a monastically oriented priest that, you know, forgive me if this is, you know, <clears throat> yeah. damaging to humility, but it's but it's kind of what <laughs> Yeronda Frem would want to see priests um, practice like in 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 that sense. So it's yes. And, and you know what happened, of course, then I began to visit St. Anthony's. Then I, I went to visit uh, Holy Archangels and became close to Yerinda de Scythios down there. And then I visited other uh, of Yerinda's monasteries. And then I visited, you know, in, in Wayne, West Virginia, you know, the Rocor Monastery. I mean, 
uh, St. Paisios, the Rokor Monastery in Arizona. <clears throat> and it, it so because the thing, and you know, life giving springs uh, down near Fresno, California. The, the thing that you did, here's the thing for me <clears throat> that, that I discovered. I mean, there are two things really. One has to do with kind of the mind of, of, of the church. <clears throat> uh, what, as I began to read, I began to see that there was this clear pattern that manifested itself in the lives of all these saints of these contemporary elders. And they all had different personalities. That was what was interesting to me because I'm a very gregarious guy. Like I'm just an outgoing, just who I am. Um, and, and there are gregarious, outgoing saints. I mean, people that are funny and that, uh, but the 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 um, sort of the the prayer dynamic and the worship dynamic and the confession dynamic and the the keeping of the fast, it, the same pattern kept emerging. So you say to yourself. Well, I mean, I'm not a complete idiot uh, that this is the way we're to live our life. So I, I'm going to explain one thing that for me, this may not be a big deal to some people, but because I was a Protestant evangelical and not only did I teach church history, but I taught comparative religions <clears throat> and um, what what I saw happening in my lifetime. So so. Think about, let's say from 1972, let's just say from the time I converted, right? Okay. Until about 1992, 2002, <clears throat> all the mainline denominations began to crash. They all began to compromise. They they all began to ordain women, ordain homosexuals. I mean, just, just across the board, it was just shocking. To the spirit of and, the age, well, yeah, yeah, and and even even super um, conservative groups like the the Southern Baptist Church got uh, infiltrated by those that wanted to, to move them in a liberal direction. The Missouri Synod Lutheran, who are very conservative, had that, and and those groups sort of had to retake it. Uh, but my point in all that is, <clears throat> so some people think this can't happen in Orthodoxy, right? Well. Um, I don't think the church will ever sell out, right? I mean, the church is going to stand. But um, jurisdictionally, uh, in the life of a parish, you better believe it. Oh, even For some sure. jurisdictionally. Like, you know, yeah. say there's a priest that moves that way and the, that entire parish, yeah. like, goes to that direction as well. Yeah, and that so that's why I am really emphatic about being traditional, about looking like a priest, about dressing like a priest. I never, I fly, I'm, I'm wearing my cassock. I'm out in the streets of Arlington. I, I mean, if I ever have to run into town, you know, I'm in a in a, a, a shirt, they go, what are you doing? Like, it kind of freaks them out, right? But the thing is, it's such an evangelical tool. I go to restaurants, I go to a store, people always stop me. Who are you? What are you? We talk about orthodoxy. But I'm saying that, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that because... I have seen so much compromise in other Christian groups, and I've seen them fall just to the place of it's, it's almost a in complete collapse that I am very adamant about holding the, I don't mean being a weirdo about it. Like, no, I, I mean, I'm not mean spirited about it, but uh, I think a priest should look like a priest looks in the old country. That's my opinion. I agree. And, and, you know, I feel like that, I feel like that sentiment like expands into this larger conversation. Like take, for example, people that had like, you know, terrible parents, like, you know, they grow up to either, you know, be like them or they, or they decide to raise their kids antithetical to what they experience, so that, yeah. mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, be better in, in fear of what they have before, you know, people who have sins in their past, you know, mm -hmm. go forward to, to be better and more careful than than what that than what that represented so that they don't let that bleed off into the into others and so they can help people with those same yeah. kind of issues so it's it's one of it's the greatest of... parents i know his mom was a drug addict he got taken away from her at eight they, they were divorced he got put with his dad who was an alcoholic and he had to get his dad out of the bars and stuff <clears throat> this guy is exactly what you said he said, I know what I don't want to be. He is the greatest 
dad. He, he, he coaches all these kids. He's so involved in their lives. So that's exactly right. He saw the dangers of, yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of relating to that, you know, I think there's a lot of people in the church who, you know, especially for us living in America or, you know, anybody living in Cyprus, you know, they have a lot of Protestant friends. Oh, I see. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, they have friends, they have family, they have people they love that are that are in Protestantism and just don't quite um, get it. So, mm -hmm. you know, to those people, what steps do you think Orthodox Christians should take that have mm -hmm. people like that in their life and, you know, bring them home into the church? So I'll tell you a little dynamic about our church. Um, I, I mean, this may or may not be interesting, but it's interesting to me. I'm interested in everything. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we, we've grown a lot, uh, and uh, we were averaging about 200 people when COVID hit. And uh, thankfully, uh, Metropolitan Joseph was very open, and we got to, after the first five weeks, our church was just open, and, and we had people come. It was fantastic, right? If people wanted to wear a mask, we didn't make a big deal out of it, but we only had about 10 or 12 people that masked up. So we just weren't worried about it. I got sick as a dog. My wife and I got it. We were sick and fine. We recovered. Uh, so I'm not judging anybody. You know, that's their business, what they want to do. But over the course of that, we had phenomenal growth, phenomenal growth. Um, <clears throat> in one year, I baptized 33 people. It was really, it was just incredible. And this was during the COVID years. During COVID, those two years. But because of our governor, right, who's super liberal, like like super, one of the most liberal governors in all of America, just locked down, shut down everything, we had a hundred people move away. Think about that. A hundred, they moved to Tennessee, North Carolina, Texas, Florida, Iowa, you name it. Idaho. Away from the parish. They, to other, they were in states that were free. See, the, the ah. states that had conservative governors that would let them be open and, and function, right? The schools yeah. could be open. Okay. But um, over the course of that now, we have regained all of that. We've regained uh, 100 more people. So thank God. So it, it's, it's, it's really, we have great growth here. And, and I'm telling you, I am such a believer that this is orthodoxy's kind of growth that we experience are people that have just hit the wall with other church experiences. Roman Catholic, um, evangelical Protestant, I mean, you name it. And like we have, I have 24 catechumens right now. We're going to baptize six of them, uh, bring them in on uh, Saturday. <clears throat> but I've got probably 20 more inquirers that are coming to a place where they're going to become catechumens. Wow. Now we don't advertise. We do not advertise at all. Uh, and uh, I had a, a remarkable experience the other day because I was asking my catechism class. I never did. I've never done this before. I said, "You tell me why you why you started coming here, and, and how you found out." And I mistakenly assumed they had all discovered orthodoxy online. That was just kind of a operating premise I had. So. Let's have a good website so people can access it. A lot of but people do it nowadays. Yeah, but I discovered that only about half of these people had been online looking at orthodoxy. They were just courageous enough to actually visit. So it's sort of shocking to me. Uh, and and we're we're a, a you know somewhat of a commuter church. I mean, people have to drive. There's not very many orthodox churches in the state of Washington, so people have to drive quite a ways. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is. The same kind of hunger that I had, they have. And I think because of all the hell I went through to get into the church, uh, I get it. Like, I get them. I get their struggles. I get their fears. I get their family being against them. Like, my family thought I flipped, right? My mom didn't come to my ordination. Like, no. Uh -uh. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and we had I, I tell you I actually believe there were a few people that really believed orthodoxy was true when we made our initial conversion, but that they could not resist the family pressure they were getting. And so, I'm sure it makes it 
easier for you to minister to these people that have similar problems that you had when you were first coming to the church? Yes, it really is super helpful. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm actually thankful that I had had that Protestant experience because I do, I really get where they're coming from. Yeah. 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 Now, you know, <clears throat> I feel like it's a, um, I feel like it is a, um, a treasure to you that you are able to help others in this way. But, you know, I'm cradle. Most of yeah. the people I've ever interacted <laughs> with are cradle. We come from Greece. We come from Russia, Serbia, whatever the case. Even in America, there's native born yeah. Orthodox Christians. Yeah. Um, and what I see sometimes, sometimes online and offline is a, is a zeal for orthodoxy, which is a good thing. But what comes with that is also like this intuition to fight heresy and to and to push back a uh, wrong think per se and and sometimes what that does is it discourages people from coming into the church so i guess my question would be is how should we balance zealousy for our faith and our dogmas and our saints um and how do we balance that with the love for our brothers as we're attempting to impart the truth on them even if they may not get it yet or realize it yeah well, you know, I've had lots of experiences and, and we have, you know, cradle in our church too. And one thing that's interesting in our church is I do my uh, catechism. We have liturgy and we have a meal and we come up for catechism. And I have a lot of cradle people that come because they tell me I didn't learn any of this. I just, I wasn't educated when I came in. I just, you know, Yaya said, do this or, you know, so so I try to help them, you know, learn that way. But I really believe because I have I have had some contact with some old calendar uh, Greek groups, right? <clears throat> now, like heretical about, old calendarists or like ideologically old calendarists? Like, what do you mean particularly? Uh, well, I mean, they're not in communion with anybody. OK, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I'm not criticizing them because actually I understand what they're what they're protesting against like i get that but it, it's very interesting to me that in almost every experience it's sort of been based on negative right like uh they're against you because of the calendar they're against you because of how you dress they're against it's like it's a super negative vibe if that makes yeah. any sense and <clears throat> And that it was a, really a turnoff to me. I thought, wow, are you going to build this whole movement on what's wrong with everybody else? Yeah, there's no philotimo in, uh, no. in the way yeah. they treat other people. So, yeah. Yeah. And and I don't want to paint with too broad a brush because I'm sure there are wonderful people. I'm just talking yeah, about there's nice ones for the sure. leadership I've been exposed to. And we've had a couple people uh, come to our church from old calendar groups. And, uh, and as I engage them in conversation, they... They they're kind of shocked. They go, gosh, you know, you're never uptight, and the church always seems loving and happy. And I go, well, what do you want me to be like? You're not going to gain anybody by grinding an axe on them or tell them that they're an idiot, right? Can't catch bees with trash, just with honey. So yeah, right. It's the bee and the fly principle, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I I, I guess uh, I do, but but here's I want I want to make a distinction though. Because I am all for being uncompromising about the faith. So in other words, <clears throat> there is sometimes some people get criticism because th they they won't flex on a on a an important doctrine in the life of the church. Well, I'm the same way. I, I, I'm 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 not I won't flex on that because this is the truth. This is the, the the phronema right that's been passed the mind of the church has been passed down to us so uh, so i see uh so i see uh angry old calendarists or i see angry converts that have blogs that don't know very much and they're always uptight about something they're always trying to teach somebody they're always trying to we just we're studying today we're doing the latter divine ascent and one it is interesting that uh, it, in the, on talkativeness, one of the things uh, that St. John talks about is how these talkative people always want to be teachers. They always want to teach others. 
Now that was interesting to me. I mean, I just I sort of uh, sort of mold that over here. So I, I I tell my people in church, I said, really be careful. Like, don't get your information online hardly at all because you get in these crazy chat rooms and these argument groups and these blogs that are negative and oh. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Now you know what I mean. See, and that's a really funny <laughs> thing though because you know I. I'm going to say I used to be like that, but I still have that little demona of proselytizing to people when I shouldn't be. So, you know, I, there's... um. Well, here's the thing, though. Spinji means by proselytizing. So, like uh, for me, like, I really believe orthodoxy is the truth. It is the truth. And I believe everybody needs to become orthodox. So, I am always sowing seed. Like, just my personality is... And I'll challenge them, you know, in a nice way. Maybe but you're not badgering way. people, like no, I won't badger them. No, yeah. mm -mm. But what I do is I try and see if there's any interest. Like I'm kind of fishing, and you know, if there's interest, then we'll pursue it. And if not, no, I just let it drop. Yeah. So you know, I feel like this has been a pretty decently discussed topic of discussion um, amongst Orthodox Christians over the past like couple months about how um, Christ in his ministry on earth was was dispassionate and how the saints are dispassionate and how they don't, like you said, you know, talk people down and um, have like these, these fiery arguments that push people away from the church. What would you say for people that, you know, either see that in themselves or don't, but want to be teachers in the church in a way that... Um, fosters humility within themselves and is helpful to others like how do you make that switch <clears throat> yeah well i think part of it is a big part of it is <clears throat> hopefully you've got a spiritual father <clears throat> hoping this person can have a frank talk with you <clears throat> remember one time <clears throat> my spiritual father I, the person i go he's a yerunda in a monastery and i remember one day i was confessing that i judge you know i was judging this person and that person and I remember he said to me, just very casually, he goes, you know, he goes, I used to judge people. He goes, I don't judge anybody anymore. I could have fallen out of my chair. Like, I, what? Well, you, well, you don't judge anybody. Are you kidding me? So it's funny today because we're we're in this in the chapter on slander in the latter divine ascent. We had a study, a study group on Thursday mornings. <laughs> and uh, so so gossip and slander and and how everybody realized it's so easy to get caught up in this. I mean, everybody in our room was convicted. Okay. So, I mean, how do you how do you approach that? I I think that like like let's suppose I have a struggling uh husband in my church. Okay, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take this guy out to coffee. I'm going to go out to lunch. We're going to, we're going to talk. And, um, and I, and I mean, I do this and I say, now, listen, you got to get your act together. You got to be the big boy in this thing. You know, you've got to resolve these comments. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to apologize. Let's talk about your prayer rule. What's going on here? <clears throat> Not meanly like, like, but. But the thing well, that you could change starts with yourself, of course. Yes. Right. Yes. And, 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 you know, um, I mean, I've got to be confronted by things. And, and you know, fortunately, <clears throat> I can't speak for every priest, uh, but I have such a tight group of priest friends. There's maybe a dozen of me, 14 of us, and we connect every day. That's got to be fun. It's unbelievable. And and the thing is, it's not gossipy. It's not, right? It's, what about this? What do you do here? Have you, have you thought about this? Are you reading this book here? What do you... It is so incredible, but, but part of it's we're all on the same page, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the deal. <clears throat> but I, anyway, to answer your question, I think if I had somebody that was sort of going off half cocked, I'd try and reel them back in and just say, listen, now, uh, first of all, why, why are you even trying to teach? Like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Uh, like, it's like me interviewing you. Like, I'm not going to seek you out for an interview. Like, what have I got? To, I don't really think I have very much to say, to be honest about it. But you asked me, so, okay, I thought, all right, fine, I'll, I'll accommodate you. But I'm not looking for... And I mean, I'm I'm loving every second of this. You're doing wonderful. But, um, you know, 
I, I feel like, I mean, direct connection to a spiritual father is important for every passion that people struggle with. And, you know, some spiritual medicines taste slightly more bitter than others. And I can say that from experience. Um, but so look, if you look at Metropolitan Erotheos Blackos, if you, um, you know, the latter divine is sin, uh, the homily is a Saint Isaac. What, what's interesting is, see, this uh, Metropolitan Erotheos Blackos really helped me a lot uh, you know, orthodox psychotherapy, right? See, key mm -hmm. therapy of the soul. But and, th and then the follow up to that was spiritual medicine. But one of the things he stresses is you have to find a physician that can heal you. And you can't find healing unless you find a physician that is healed. Right. So this is huge. Like, like, what's the function of a priest? Is the function of a priest just to do services? Is the function of a priest to, to preach good homilies? And well, yeah, okay, I mean, that's part of it. But ultimately, the function of a priest is to get healed so that in turn, he can help heal other people. And so to me, like this group I'm a part of, right, this 14 priests, the deal is we all know we need to be healed. And, and we all try and help each other. And sometimes guys get discouraged and we try to encourage them. And, you know, I mean, we might even make fun of each other once in a while, you know, just, but the point is, I mean, th this is the pattern in the life of the church. Uh, a, a healed Yerunda, a healed bishop, a healed priest can heal others. Okay, but what's the truth of the matter? The truth of the matter is that, let's say in America, not all bishops are healed. Not all priests are healed. Not all abbots, all yerundas are healed. Now that that's just the truth. Or, or there may be in varying degrees of healing. So the question is, what what can you give? Like, look, I'll just tell you a quick story. Then I'm going to relate it to orthodoxy. Sure. Uh, when the Southern Baptist uh, Convention got taken over, uh, they got taken over. They have a national convention, and they they orchestrated this. So they put all these liberal leaning Baptists in place. What's the first thing they did? They replaced all the heads of the seminaries and professors. Oh, wow. So they get people to teach that they want to teach. Okay. Well, look at same thing's true in orthodoxy, right? The reality is this, who oversees the seminary? Because the, the head of the seminary, the president of the seminary, the, the tr board of trustees, uh, the professors in the seminary, all of those things uh, there's my granddaughter in the background. Hi, honey. Hi, granddaughter. Uh, yeah. uh, all of those things have an effect, right? So whether it's Holy Cross or St. Tecons or St. Vladimir's or, you know, you name it. <clears throat> the degree of healing that is present in the bishops or the confessors or the professors is what's going to get passed on. And so, so I have a lot of friends that uh, I'm not, and again, look at, I'm not, I'm not here knocking seminaries. That's not what I'm doing. But I've had a lot of friends that came out and all of a sudden the kind of stuff I'm talking to you about, they go, gosh, we just hardly ever talked about this in seminary. And we didn't read about these things. And then they get exposed to these things. So they're in the process of being healed, if that makes any sense. It does. Now, you know, relating to that, and I'm sure this is a tough position that, you know, I have I have met more than a few Orthodox Christians that have been in this conundrum. Um, you know, may God grant all of our priests grace and and um, and foresight and the the spirit to help people the best way they can. But if an Orthodox Christian is stuck with a spiritual father due to geographical, you know, constraints or, you know, whatever the case may be that is not helping them after all options have been exhausted to make it work yeah you know what what do you do if there even is something to do well yeah <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> you know i do think <clears throat> i i actually i really believe that if a person is spiritually hungry they're going to find a way to connect with somebody that can heal them so Let's just take Elder Ephraim of Katanakia, uh, or Saint Saint Ephraim of Katanakia. Now I got him right over there. Yeah, right yeah, there. exactly. Uh, one of the greatest saints, contemporary saints ever. Why? 
because he lived in a horrible relationship with his spiritual father was cruel to him. He was mean, right? But he sought out and he he made a connection with uh, Yerunda Yosef, you know, with, with St. Joseph, the Hezekast. <clears throat> and so even though his daily life was pretty miserable, he would get away and do the services up there and got exposed to the brotherhood and, and got formed by, by uh, Yerunda uh, Yosef. So I, so anyway, uh, look, if you got cancer, you better find a good cancer doctor. And, and if, if you got emphysema, you better find a good pulmonologist. So if, if a person is hungry spiritually, you need to find a good spiritual father. So what does that mean? Maybe you can't move. Maybe that you're, but then what you can do is you say, okay, I'm, I go here on Sunday mornings. I'm going to honor this priest. I'm going to receive the Holy Mysteries. I'm going to go, you know, but maybe, I don't know, like once every three months or whatever that means, you take a drive somewhere, you go to a monastery or you find a priest that you can confess to that you feel, um, and, and just let your other parish priest know that. Just say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going here now for confession. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to be offended by that. Sure. Yeah, but they shouldn't be anyway. Uh, and But that's the key. I think you've got to find somebody that can heal you for sure and you know maybe talking about those who are spiritually sick and don't even know it um you know primarily referring to people that tout themselves or um or you know tell others that they're atheist and a lot of the motivation from that comes from bad experiences in prior denominations you know through experiences with their family through an old parish whatever and they just get mean and and volatile um what can we do to help them and bring them back into the light without pushing them farther away by accident because that's also a possibility no i agree with you actually a lot on what you just said there <clears throat> and uh, that's one of my main contentions is that the reason people have become atheist or agnostic or just angry is because they had a lousy experience and or or because the teaching wasn't true that's why i that's why i'm saying i think this is orthodoxy's moment to shine because my experience is that when these people get exposed to orthodoxy and serious orthodoxy but loving orthodoxy right you know like like people uh Saint, well, father seraphim rose right the, he has his detractors. Well, and why does he have detractors? Well, I think one reason was because he was a homosexual for a while, right? What? Th Maybe, that's all, yes. That's all the more reason that he should be revered because he overcame his passion. But I think the other reason people have resistance to him is because he seems so radical. Like, what? I mean, this beard and you live up in the mountains and you... But, but the thing is... I can relate to that guy so much because when you have been starving, when you are, are dying of thirst and somebody sets a water bottle in front of you, somebody gives you food, you are going to just go for that with all your gusto. And I just think that he discovered the truth and he met St. John Maximovich and it just, it just changed his life. That, that's the thing for me. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't want to compare myself. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that at all. I was going to say there is a relation between your spiritual hunger prior to your introduction to orthodoxy and his, you know, lifestyle prior to it, and then coming in and being a vicious yeah. defender of the faith. Yeah. Yes, and, and 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 I know a lot of people that are like me because, you know, you don't get what it was like. Well, I mean, maybe people don't get what it was like to not have this. And then all of it. So, and for me, like I, cause I often I'll, I'll say to people or, or to myself, why did God reveal the church to me? I, I don't know the answer to that. Like all, all sorts of people could experience worth. They could discover orthodoxy. Why, why of all the knuckleheads in the world did this take with me? Well, all I know is I think it's because I really, even though I'm an idiot and, and I fail miserably, uh, I do have a hunger for God, like I, I a hunger. And so I think when we encounter people that are like that, 
I think you you know you kind of hit on the key. There's something in the background. There's something happened to them. And so the thing is, like again, so me, you know, like we've got a restaurant in my town. So this is very funny. If you ever come to Arlington, Washington, it's called the Bluebird. And I'm in that restaurant two, three days a week. And I'm always meeting with people. And the waitress go, hey, Father Dave, I got this booth in the back. We just go in the back. And um, but I just want to talk to people like that. See, that's the kind of people I want to talk to. And I'm not, I mean, am I going to try and convert them? Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to hard sell them. I'm just going to say, tell me your story. And usually when they tell you their story, you realize they got burned or this is some weirdo Christian experience that they had. And it doesn't have anything to do with the church. Sure. It, yeah. It's um, it's particularly heartbreaking to see people like that. And, and you know, like you said, you, you sit them down, you say, what's your story? You know, how did things get to be where they are in your head? But, you know, some people are so deep in and this isn't me like you know yeah. smack talking them but you know some mm -hmm. people are just so deep in their spitefulness for any concept of the church that you you hunger for them to come back but they yeah. just but they are just showing no visible interest and that hurts but i guess at the at that point the only thing you could have is patience and prayer which is like you know the best thing ever but still right it's like, because uh, because the thing is you don't know like i told you at the very beginning voted least likely to ever even become a Christian, let alone a pastor, would have been Dave Volkick, Everett High School, class of 1972. No chance. So why did this happen? Right? I mean, so what does Father Seraphim Rose say? Like, what is God looking for? God's looking for a loving heart. God's looking for an open heart. You know, it's like the parable of the soils. Uh, you know, a hard pan, uh, it grows up a little bit and withers, uh, the sticker bushes crush it, and finally it finds some fertile soil. <clears throat> so if you could say, what what is the purpose of our life in Christ, without being too simplistic, you could say, the purpose of our life in Christ is to make sure the soil of our noose, right, the soil of our heart is soft. Because See, people in Protestants, they always want to make that about hearing the gospel and accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. No, that that parable is for you and me every day of our lives, for everybody that's listening to this podcast, right? That God is trying to speak something. He, he's trying to plant a seed. And sometimes our heart is just doink, just nothing. Sometimes it starts a little bit and then it just withers off. But sometimes, right, that soil is ready for it like uh, being exposed to the monastic life, being exposed to having a good spiritual father, being exposed to making a really thorough confession, being exposed to partaking of the Eucharist more than just once a week on Sunday. But that's the result of a person's heart being receptive. So anyway, I, I just think, you know, in one sense, I'm a priest, but in one sense, I'm a farmer. I'm trying to cultivate. I'm trying to plow up. You know, I live in a, I live farmer in a rural Dave. area. Yeah, And one of the greatest things, I drive from the freeway into my little town of Arlington, and we're just starting right now. Now they're going to start tilling the soil. Then they're going to plant the corn. And it's seasonal. You see it. And you know what? That's the spiritual life. It's got to be nice to watch. I like I like watching farmers do their thing. It's cool. Me too. Yeah, I love it. Um, Now, you just kind of talked about it. It's like good spiritual father. Um, The acquisition of the grace of the Holy Spirit through um through the sacraments of communion and confession like these are it are these the keys to softening one's heart do you think do you think these are what could turn somebody from cold and isolated to the reception of god's grace into people that you know are are loving and could be the fountains of grace to those around <clears throat> them you know i think it's all of that stuff right because here's the thing like you remember uh, father sarah from rose he was drunk, right? When he cried out to God in the streets of San Francisco and he fell down weeping and all of a sudden, Koo, right? So, I mean, I'm in a single wide trailer in Grand Coulee, Washington and praying this little prayer and wham. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, I just think there are all these things that coalesce in a person's life. But let, let us take a, a person who, I'll just tell you a, a quick, funny little story. So my daughter married a Greek guy, Okay. And uh, they Thank met on, on the day when we were uh, 
uh, brought into the church they met and they dated and eventually got married. Okay, so I go to the Greek church in Seattle. I go, oh, Father Dave, you don't have a Greek boy. You're almost a Greek. Okay, <laughs> but then they started having grandbabies, right? Their last name is Sukalis. And uh, they go, oh, Father Dave, you got Greek grandbabies. You're Greek. Okay, <laughs> so, so I realize that uh, there is a, a part of orthodoxy that I'll never know. And that is like in my, um, I just did a retreat back in Chicago in, in a, 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 a Jordanian, primarily Jordanian parish. It was fantastic. It was so great. And, but I just realized there's so much love and so there's a certain like ethnic connectedness that we won't, we don't have that in our parish or you go to a Greek parish, you go to a Serbian parish. There's okay. So I think that's beautiful. But the question is, right, the risky part of that is, is that the primary reason I'm going? Is it because my cousins and my uncles and my yayas and my my grand, they're there and, and I feel good because I love these people? And that's for great. some people that the answer is yes, sadly yeah, enough. But, I think for yeah. some people, the answer is yes. So those are the ones we got to say, because here's the deal. Is it Holy Trinity Orthodox Church? Or is it Holy Trinity, Greek Orthodox Church, Antiochian Orthodox Church, Serbian Orthodox, and they underscore that. Um, I don't like that. We, we are St. Andrew Orthodox Church, and underneath it says Antiochian Archdiocese. Because mm. I, I want the emphasis to be Orthodox. Th this is the primary thing. Okay. But I mean, to answer your question, <clears throat> I do think it's having a good spiritual father. Like, like I, 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 this guy, I'll tell you, I won't tell you who this is. This is a really great story. <clears throat> this priest, he's a friend of mine. And he was telling me he went off to college and uh, he went off to college. He's in Illinois and he went to a, a parish and the same, same jurisdiction as him. And he went up to go to confession or go to, to receive communion and the priest says, when's the last time you went to confession? Because you're a new college student. He goes, oh, well, I, you know, I don't know, years. He goes, no, no communion. And so he said he was shocked. He was shocked. But that guy took him under his wing as a spiritual father. And and he says to this day, he still goes to me. He's still his father confessor. The guy's about my age now, you know, his, I mean, the confessor. <laughs> but he said it changed his life because he held him accountable. Like he just didn't let him skate through that. Okay, so I do think, yeah, the sacraments are important. I, I having a good spiritual father that's going to hold you accountable is really important. But I actually also think what you do with your time, uh, like what do you read, what what are you watching? So because I hear confessions all over the country, I know people are hours on their cell phones, and they're looking at stupid stuff, right? And they're on they're on there and YouTube and it or whatever they're doing, you know, uh, X in it or uh, and and it's not all necessarily bad but i'm not sure it's necessarily good well the overexposure is killing people yeah. you know spiritually yeah. mentally all that and yep. you know you yep. can really you can really only beat that drum so many times before people kind of get the point it's like you forget who you were before all of this infiltrated you know your normative lifestyle so and see and i think a parish can be um diverse i don't want to say fractured but I always think like, let's say our church, okay, we got 200 people. <clears throat> now we have people that are catechumens, that have been Orthodox for a little while, been Orthodox for a long time. Some people are Orthodox their whole life. And all of those people are at varying degrees of spiritual maturity, right? And, and why one of them suddenly gets a hunger, that's somewhat of a mystery, I think, of the Holy Spirit, how it works. But But here's the thing. I think the Holy Spirit's always drawing. So then now we're back to what are you doing? Or do you even realize that you have a responsibility to soften up the soil of your heart so that when something does come along? So like I always try to talk to people like in confession, what are you reading? I want to know what they're reading. Are, are you reading the scriptures? Are you What books are you reading? Can we have a discussion about this? Yeah. Yeah. And for some people, it just kind of clicks for them out of nowhere when the Holy Spirit, yep. you know, yep. exactly brings them in. Um, And we've talked a lot about educating others. And 
you i mean you've had i'm sure you've had your own spiritual transformation going from you know one end of spiritual things to the other and you know yeah. settling down in the right place but <laughs> what do you think properly educating others about the faith does to affect our own souls and spiritual lives and this could be like specific to you or just more in a general sense mm -hmm. okay so in other words how does would teaching impact the teacher is that what you're asking yeah yeah okay yeah no i think a lot i'm i and i realize i'm probably in a lot of trouble like when i stand before god he'd probably just shake his head but join the club yeah no really i'm i mean i'm very serious about that but the, the thing I I am been thankful for <clears throat> is that when you are forced to teach, you're forced to learn, like you're forced to acquire knowledge. And so I do think uh, because I am always having to teach catechism classes or because I sort of naturally like to talk to people, um, it's forced me to think through and, and to read, uh, you know, I mean, voluminously, just I read a lot. Uh, to try and have, you know, not just answers, right? Because sometimes I read Orthodox books and they're kind of goofy. I mean, they're just kind of like, but uh, again, I guess I, I was saying earlier, like the phronema, right? This mind that you get when you read th these really holy people from, but they could be from Russia, from Greece. I mean, they could, you know, St. John Maximovich coming through China, but there's this same thread that manifests itself. So that's what I am trying to acquire uh, as poorly as I have done is the mind. What's the mind of the church? And this is the mind of the church, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, how, uh, uh, like, I, people say, well, I, you know, should people really be doing the Jesus prayer? Are you kidding me? I mean, when I give people a rule of prayer, one of the first thing, I mean, this is a 300 knotter, but let's say where there's a hundred knots there. You know, I just tell people, uh, you can do this. You need to start doing 100 Jesus prayers and 50 to the Theotokos. That's going to be our baseline. And then they come and we talk about it. They go, my mind's wandering all over. I go, well, my mind's wandering everywhere. Father Joseph Copeland, he said to me once, this is a great, one of the greatest things anybody's ever said to me. He says, Father David, he said, at some point, we can't give God quality. Because we don't have it. All we can give him is quantity, right? So that's, I, and I tell people, okay, once you do 100, do 200. Do 200 and 100 of the Theotokos. Do 300 and 100 of the Theotokos. I mean, and so in our church, the Jesus prayer is very important for everybody. It keeps people locked in. Yeah. Do you see a rise in Protestants coming to the Orthodox Church over the past, like, decade or two in particular? And if so, what do you think is causing it? Like, you talked a little bit before about how this is Orthodoxy's mm -hmm. kind of time to shine. Like, what you know, what, do you think it's kind I of... I totally believe that. I yeah. 100% that, because that's what we have. I mean, we just have Protestant converts coming out of the wood, especially evangelicals, because... You know, here's the thing. Um, I realize that sometimes when an Orthodox <clears throat> talks to an evangelical priest, they don't get it because they've only been raised in an Orthodox church. They don't understand where they're coming from. Uh, it's kind of like that priest saying to me, why do you want to become a priest? Right. I mean, what? Uh, because he, that's all they'd ever known. Right. Was was his church. OK, so. These people, here's the thing about, about Protestantism, about, about evangelical Protestantism. It's a dirty little secret. And the dirty little secret is that they don't necessarily convert all that many people. It's that people move from church to church to church to church. So in my area, we have many evangelical churches. Now, I've been in this town for 43 and a half years. Wow. So I've seen all the migratory uh patterns and all of a sudden i won't name any churches but all of a sudden this church is a hot church well everybody's going there oh oh no now now this church is a hot church and maybe because they like the music or here or maybe so it becomes like a they, trend thing yeah the, yeah oh it's a, yeah for sure it's a trend thing and what i realized early on as an evangelical protestant pastor 
uh, and so we're talking way back now in 1980. I, I just saw that the church was driven by the culture. That if, if there's a primary driving force um, in evangelical Protestantism, apart from, you know, the, there may be good intentions to want to know, have people know Jesus Christ. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to contest that at all. Uh, that's just a given. But I mean, the way they approach it, it's all culturally driven. So when you look at the history of evangelical Protestantism, you know, early on, <clears throat> the Assembly of God and the Four Square Churches, they were kind of on the outskirts. They were like kind of off scouring little tiny little churches. People made fun of them. But all of a sudden, about 1969, 70, 71, when the charismatic movement hit, wham, right? And now all of a sudden, the biggest church in town is the Assembly of God. The biggest church in town is the Four Square Church. And these other churches are losing people. And they said, uh-oh, now we, we got to get on this bandwagon. And that's what you see happening. So what's funny is all the, there used to be sort of distinctive worship patterns in a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, a Presbyterian church, right? But in the evangelical churches, they've all coalesced. So they all have a praise band. They all got drums and basses and synthesizers and guitars. And they have little singing groups, you know, praise bands. And why? I mean, then they went through a phase where they had seeker-friendly services. So they took down anything that was like a cross or anything that was would re be religious. And they met in buildings that were like gymnasiums. And they built churches that had basketball hoops on either end and had a stage with stage lights and everything was black. And look, I, I mean, I've just seen all of this. And that may have evolved into the mega church thing you see with like Joel Osteen and whatever. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, so, so even, so yeah, so these little ones are sort of wannabes that, that you know, they're maybe not as good, at, but, but my point in all that is, is that because back to your original question, why are so many, uh, Protestants converting to Orthodoxy, at least my experience, right? And, you know, Washington uh, and Oregon are the two least church states in America. Isn't that interesting? So I had no idea. In New, states in New England and uh, Washington, Oregon, we're very low church attendance. <clears throat> but people that are coming have gone through this crazy cycle. They've gone to different churches. They see all these changes. And all of a sudden, I mean, I get it if you're in your 20s and you want to rock a little bit, you know, but come on. When in your late 30s, you're 40, I mean, you're starting to grow up a little bit. And I think what happens is these people see this and they say, which was my driving thing. Here, here was the drive. People go, what, what caused you to become, move towards orthodoxy? And it was this, there has to be more to worship than what I'm experiencing in an evangelical Protestant church. There has to be more. I didn't know what that more was. And so when these people come to our church, I know that's the question. See, I I really, I, because I said, I've been there. I get it. Yeah. Hmm. You know. So so I just think that's the issue. Now, uh, are Orthodox very good at catechizing? Maybe not. Orthodox very good at being welcoming? Well, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I hear stories about churches, but. It fluctuates. Our church, you know, we have a meal every Sunday. So that's a big deal for us, right? We have food teams and everybody goes down. Not everybody comes, but, you know, probably two thirds. And you get to know new people and new people get to feel like they can make some friendships. And yeah. And in all that traveling and as your long and your long tenure as a priest with meeting all these people from all these places coming from different spiritual states what if you know aside from what we've already talked about because i love your stories but what would you say would be the most personally impactful moment in your life as a priest uh -huh. okay <clears throat> that's a good question actually i would say i've had a few um i so, want to hear them all so yeah so what I, what I mentioned to you for example um well i'll tell you uh, uh my first trip to mount Athos was very impactful for me. And uh, I went with Father Paul Yaroslav, a good friend of mine, and some other handful of other people. And the first time um, they brought out the relics at Philotheo Monastery after Compline, 
I, I can't hardly explain the emote. Uh, something happened like just I was overwhelmed with just tears. I mean, it was so powerful. I can hardly put my finger on it. And then uh, one of the last monasteries we went to was Vatopedi. And they brought out the belt of the Theotokos, you know, the, the, the skull of St. John Chrysostom. And I, I mean, again, like this same feeling. And I'm not a person that's given it over to this. So I don't want you to think like, oh, yeah. No, it was so weird to me, uh, but in a beautiful way, like 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 an emotion that was just, it, it enveloped me. <clears throat> so that, that was way back in 2005. <clears throat> and then I went about five years ago, Father Justin Havens, who's a really one of my, probably my closest priest friend in the world. <clears throat> we went back over and uh, we have a Father Peter here. So he had a group and we uh, we traveled. And uh, because uh, Father Peter has all these great connections over there, instead of going to these big monasteries, we went to these skeets. And we went to skeets in northern Greece. We went to Meteora. <clears throat> um, but we, but these elders talked to us. It's very interesting to me. It, it was really so impactful because, you know, they didn't talk to each other. They didn't know we were coming. And, and they were talking about, because we were mostly priests with a few monks, okay, uh, that were, you know, a group of about 10. <clears throat> and they were talking to us about how to be a shepherd. And, and they kept saying, uh, you lead with a flute not with a stick. See, that goes back to what you're saying earlier about being angry and all that, right? Like what's a spiritual father? So here's these renowned spiritual fathers on Mount Athos. And they all said the same thing. They said, you've got to get healed. And, and when you lead people, you have to be kind. You have to be loving. You have to be compassionate. You can't force people to change. It's not going to happen. So that, that was very, a very impactful thing for me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just think, uh, other than that, I mean, my encounters with uh, godly priests, uh, like Father Demetrius Corellis, he's a wonderful guy. That's my mother's and spiritual father. He's your mother's spiritual father? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I really I love that guy. But you know what I love about him? I'm, I'm a little bit of a crybaby. You can kind of tell that. But, <laughs> but he's a big crybaby. And so whenever you go to a... Uh, a uh, seminar that he does, you know, a retreat, he starts talking about the Theotokos, man, he just waterworks, right? He just burst out because he loves the Theotokos. Now, I'm not going to go into that guy's life, but if you, if you chronicled his life, oh, that guy's yeah. had a lot of pain. He I, I know it. Pain. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you see, I, I don't think you can, like, I don't, I don't regret any of the hardships and suffering has ever been through. Because I think that is the thing that softens you up. So instead of being mad at God about that stuff. Look what it does to you. It's great. Yeah. Is it, Like after the fact, it's great. But it's great in like hindsight for sure. Yes. No, I have a buddy that just went through hell. Just really went through hell. And, and he's still recovering. But, but what I know for sure is it's going to change his whole life as a priest. It's going to, for the better, for the better. Uh so, yeah, I think, I guess those are the kind of things that maybe have changed my life. And, you know, every once in a while, like today, I'll just tell you a funny thing. I, we have this little study group on, we have Orthros Liturgy, and then we have a study group on Thursdays. <clears throat> and um, one of the mothers said to me, her little son, who can just, is barely learning how to talk. Um, oh, no, I take that back. No, no, it's, it, I, I'm sorry. It was a mother. We have a son who has Down syndrome. That's what it is. And so he's learning how to do his rule of prayer. And uh, at the end of his rule of prayer, he starts singing, God grant you many years. God grant you many years. And so the mom goes, who are you singing that to? What, what were you singing that? He goes, that was for Father David. And I thought, oh, my gosh. You know, that's the kind of stuff, the rewards that a priest get. I said, just tell him thank you. Because, I mean, I, I'll take all the prayers I can get. That's for sure. That's incredible. Yeah. In meeting all of these holy people, you know, from um, your little Down syndrome friend, who's who's far holier than I'll ever be, to, to all these amazing clergy and, um, and priests and whatever the case may be, amongst them, 
um, who have been, I guess, the inspirations or the encouragement for the work you do amongst the priests, you know, the bishops, the monks, whatever the case may be? Well, you know, I think there are people that I have <clears throat> friendships with that. Yeah, I, I was uh, talking to somebody the other day about this. I think there's a lot of priests. I know this is true because I've talked to priests. So there are a lot of priests that don't really have deep friendships. It's very sad. Like, I, I don't really understand it exactly. I, I don't know what happened that, that prevented that. And maybe they're isolated. But so like Father Justin Havens, F Father Par Yaroslav, and Father Joseph Copeland. I mean, these are all people that I've known for so many years and, and I can call them up on the phone or we can text and and we can bear our souls. Like, like you know, like Father Justin, I mean, we, we'll do confession with each other. I mean, so heavy, so down, like just down. As, and I mean, we're both weeping when we're doing this right and we're hugging each other at the end. So I, I guess, I mean, honestly, A, I don't know why God opened up my heart to orthodoxy. I, I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> I don't know why God has blessed me to be in this great parish, to live in the same town, this little tiny farming community of, of 20,000 people. Uh, and and I, and why has God given me this wonderful group of priest friends when I know so many people that don't have that? I don't know. Because I don't know the answer to any of those questions. But I know I give thanks to God continually for those things. And, and you know what? God's given me a great family. Like I have a, a, a wonderful wife. It's supportive. Like the other day I had to go out and she goes, you know, good thing I'm, I'm not too demanding. And, and that's the truth, right? Because as a priest, you're always on call. Who, who takes it in the end? The wife takes it. The, the kids have to suffer, right? And I've been very diligent to try and go on a date night with my wife. And I, you know, I take my kids uh, when they were little, we'd always do things. I, I'm, but but the point is, there's a big sacrifice there. And you need some support. And and uh, A, a good spouse is a good support. <laughs> your kids are a good support. And your priest buddies. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, doing this little project of mine, I feel like I have gotten closer to the right kind of crowd and friends. And I consider you now my father and my friend after almost two and a half hours so it's, yeah. it's you know it, it's it's really been special for me to to connect with people this way um this is gonna be a little bit of a funny one and i really don't ask this often but what would you say is your favorite part about being a priest hmm. well <clears throat> i'll say this i really love serving the liturgy so i love ortho i love the services <clears throat> so for me I have some friends that they don't really, you know, they don't necessarily enjoy it. They sort of do it. That's odd to me. So I don't, I don't really understand that. Um, hearing confessions, like when people are really honest, like they open their heart up completely. Uh, that's really like, sometimes I'll hear somebody make a confession. I'll go, Oh my gosh, that person is so much deeper than I am. That person has come into such greater contact with who they are than who I am. It, it shocks me that I, I, every once in a while that'll happen. <clears throat> but I also think that I, I like teaching. I, 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 I mean, I don't know that I have very many gifts, but I think I'm a, a pretty good teacher. So I really do love catechism. It's just, you're a good storyteller too. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I got a lot of them. You don't want to hear them all. <laughs> no. No. I got it. But no, no, I um, I could definitely. Well, I think all of that, really. Uh, yeah, I could. And, you I know, like, like I hear the thing. I like having fun. So every time kids come to church, they go, "Father David, you got some candy?" Because they know I have candy, so I have it in my office, and I always give them candy. And and I have a deal in my church. If I pull your tooth out, if you pull your tooth out, I'll give you a buck. But if I pull it out, you get five bucks. And they line up. They <laughs> those kids line up to get five bucks. Father David, five after best for Father David, pull my tooth. So, so I think you can be serious about your faith, and be joyful about your faith, like like Saint Porphyrios, right? Yes. 
that, 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 that if there's a driving force in my life, it is that, that you can be a joyful Orthodox Christian who is serious about their faith. Those two are not incompatible. Yeah. I mean, Christ was serious at every moment and joyful at every moment. And he wasn't yeah. shy about letting people know about either. So, you know, I think that's, I think yeah, that's he wasn't quite as goofy as I am, but yeah. well, you know, yeah. but um, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm sure that you know the lives of the saints and patristics works have have helped you just as much as your interactions with um with different priests and different holy people. So, which writings and lives of the saints would you consider um the most helpful to your life and your work? Wow. Okay, you're getting down here because first thing I'm going to tell you a happy one. Okay, I'm going to tell you a funny one. Okay. And I often recommend this to people who seem to be struggling with uh, depression or anxiety or you know. And that's Everyday Saints. Everyday Saints is one of the greatest books because it's funny. And because these are normal people. So you realize normal people who have normal struggles can be really spiritual people, deeply spiritual. So that, I, I laugh at that book. I've read it a couple of times. It, anyway, I, okay, <clears throat> other books. Um, I say, say Theophon the Recluse, I like his writings a lot because... He addresses an issue and then he presents a solution and he addresses an issue and he presents us. So the, like his writing style to me is, is I like it a lot. Um, I think Father Arseni is a huge book for people to read because and and you know the the saints of the prison, uh, that new book, uh, 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 Valerio, um, what's his last name? Well, I can't think of it. I know who you're I talking about. But yeah. I, yeah. Um, so, so those books about, uh, like Father Roman Braga, some of these saints, like Father Roman Braga, here's a really interesting experience he had. <clears throat> I would say, I'm going to tell you a story that I think has changed my life more than any story in a book I've read, at least one of the top ones. Father Roman Braga was put in a solitary confinement cell. There only a little bit of light at the top came in. And he said, I saw him interviewed when he was an old man, He's probably about my age when I saw this interview. And he said, when they put me into that solitary confinement cell, I knew one of two things was going to happen. I was either going to go insane, go, go nuts, or I was going to have to go in and find God. <clears throat> and he said, I went in. And he said, what I discovered was, and here's the fascinating thing. He says, what I discovered was, I thought I knew God because he grew up, went to the monastery all the time. He chanted, right? Preparing to be a priest. I mean, all these things he, he knew, he said, but what I discovered was I only knew about God. I only knew about God. And in that solitary confinement cell, I began to know God. Now I'm telling you, that is a haunting refrain for me. Elder Emilia knows, right? He says, many people know about God. Not many people know God. So you know what? I'm talking to you as a friend, like be a straight shooter. I don't know if I know God. I don't know. I, I mean, I read some of these books and I think, oh my goodness. Like, I mean, I'm here. So, but I want to know God. I mean, I, I want to be on this path that brings me to a place of, so I, I actually challenge my people a lot in homilies. Like, I don't want you just to know this story or these facts, right? I want you to understand what is Jesus driving at here? Like, why did Jesus heal on the Sabbath? Why did he provoke a crisis, right? Mm. Because sometimes we're just so hard and callous that, you know, how does God break through all of that? We okay. start getting too analytical and, you know, we don't find the the spirit of of the law, as he would say. Yeah. And, you know, and like, you know, the life of St. Paisios, the, the life of, of St. Silouan. Um, again, Metropolitan Rothios Vlachos. I mean, I think his writings are for, for a priest, and even for a lay person. They are incredible. And even something as simple as the way of a pilgrim. I just think all those things, if you're ready for them, like now St. Isaac of Syria, right, his homilies, or, or, or St. Ephraim of Syria, right, his spiritual psalter. I was reading that to my uh, catechism class the other day, and I said, where does this come from? Like, like how can these two great saints, St. Isaac and St. Ephraim, 
write like this? What? It, I mean, it's it's just, it's, it's so incredible. But you realize that's the fruit of a healed noose, right? That is the fruit of a heart that is so in tune with God that the, the it just flows. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. There's a few, there's a few books for you. Uh, I got one really funny, um, life of a saint that you could, uh, that you could check out if you haven't yet. Have you ever read the life of St. Simeon of Amessa? No, I have not. That's a good one. If you want to, okay. that is, that is a very, very funny story that'll have you scratching your head a little bit, but it's a little tannish green book that you could find, but yeah, you know, may, um, so St. This... Anthony's, you know, has, has come out with these great series of these church father, classic church father books. I've seen those. They, yeah. Yes. And they were so kind that they sent to any parish that asked a giant box load of books. It, it was incredible. I, I've been distributing to our people and put them in our church bookstore. <clears throat> but uh, if people want to just start reading St. John Chrysostom, St. Bea, just basic things, I highly recommend that. Yeah, I um I I think that spiritual reading is one of the best defensive and offensive tools we have against temptations and and softening our hearts towards Christ and may all the people that write these beneficial texts intercede for us and particularly yeah. me, the chief among sinners and Father, I really can't thank you enough for coming on and and speaking with us. Would you like to end us off with a prayer? Sure. This has been a lot easier than I thought. I wasn't quite sure where we're going with this, but uh, thank you very I, much. For, yeah, okay. I, I had a fantastic time. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, O Christ our God, thank you for this time we were able to spend together. I do pray you'd open all of our hearts and anyone that happens to listen to this, help us come to a place where our noose is receptive to what your Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. I ask your blessing upon this ministry for thou art holy, both now and during two ages of ages. I mean. I mean, um, the next guest we are going to have on our podcast is going to be Father George R. A. Aquaro, who is the author of Death by Envy, The Evil Eye and Envy in the Christian Tradition. And eventually, and I'm going to start using this word eventually because I keep saying we're going to do it, but we keep getting sidetracked. We're going to continue our readings of Wounded by Love, The Life and the Wisdom of Elder Nase Porfirios. Um, Father, any final thoughts? I want to say one thing. Oh, tell me, tell me. If you, if you think I'm a character... Wait till you interview Father George Aquaro. He's a good friend of mine. He's coming on tomorrow, hopefully. He's a yeah. great guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for that one. But, you know, today's been wonderful with you. Um, any final thoughts or message for the audience? Uh, you know what? Just, it's Lent. So let's let's think about this. What can we do in Lent? You know, in the monasteries, a lot of times the nuns will do 120 prostrations a day. They double it in Lent. Isn't that interesting? So um, I guess what I'm saying is maybe when you, the one thing we can do, one of the main things is put this away, right? Try to try less screen time uh, in Lent and uh, more of this, right? More, more prayer rope. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I less agree. Less screen time and more prayer rope. I, uh, I think that considering how busy priests are going to be during the Lenten period, that we are going to be... Uh, we're going to be boosting our readings a lot. We may even get through the book before Pascha and um, we'll continue on to a couple more just because, you know, I can't, I can't inconvenience uh, guys like you too much while you guys well, are One of the busy, things so. your readers can do truly like you're really, like, what kind of ministry do I have? They need to pray for their priests and the priest yes. families. That is for sure. If that would be one of the greatest things, the gifts they could ever give. Yeah. yeah, you you are in my prayers and the prayers of my listeners, and hopefully you keep all of us in your prayers here, listening and at the Ortho Chat. And Father, it's been wonderful. Hey, Yanni, thank you. God thank bless you. So you. Much. God bless you. Yeah. Και παρεδόθης τελείως τη ραφημία Της εξαναστήσεις εκείμενος
Kyrie Sukristelle, Sama, 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 Kyr